Live from Studio 2 here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Romaine Bostic. And I'm Katie Greifeld. We are counting you down to, to the close here with a focus on that November 1st Fed decision. We know exactly what the Fed did, which was not a whole lot of anything, but what went on behind the scenes? Those minutes dropping right now. Michael McKee standing by with the readout. Well, the minutes show a united open market committee. The labor market had remained tight, but job gains had moderated, as had inflation, and that justified leaving rates unchanged at that November 1st meeting. Quote, all participants agreed that the committee was in a position to proceed carefully, the minutes say. Further tightening would be appropriate if progress toward their 2% inflation goal was insufficient, but in the meantime, all participants judged it would be appropriate for policy to remain at a restrictive stance for some time until inflation is clearly moving down substantially. Policymakers took note of the tightening in financial conditions from market rates moving up substantially, their word, in the weeks before their meeting. Many suggested the move was driven primarily or substantially by a rise in the term premium on Treasury securities. And generally, they also felt a greater supply of Treasury securities contributed to the increase. However, quote, they also noted that whatever the source of the rise in longer term yields, persistent changes in financial conditions could have implications for the path of monetary policy. Many noted it was uncertain whether the tightening would persist, however, and to what extent it reflected expectations for tighter policy. That helped make the economic outlook particularly uncertain. A strong economy might make inflation stickier. A potential broadening of the Middle East conflict might affect oil prices. Commercial real estate valuations might adversely affect some banks. And most continue to see upside risks to inflation and downside risks to growth. Leaving rates unchanged, they said, would give Fed officials more time to evaluate economic developments. Well, Mike, we think about what's happened in the week since that meeting, and obviously we've seen a huge rally in the stock market, but also in the bond market, bringing those yields down, loosening those financial conditions that those Fed members actually pointed to. And with these headlines in mind, these minutes from the Fed, how does some of this pricing for rate cuts next year stack up? It doesn't really give us any indication of what they're thinking about that. They did emphasize the need to keep rates higher for longer. They took into consideration where rates had gone and the possible tightening of financial conditions from that, but made it clear they weren't sure that that would continue. And, of course, it did not. So it doesn't seem to be a major factor in their continuing ongoing outlook. All right, Michael McKee, our Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Editor down there in Washington, a readout of the Fed minutes from that October 31st, November 1st Fed decision, a decision that left the rate hiking cycle on pause. Constant Hunter joining us right now, senior advisor over at Macro Policy Perspectives to help us kick off to the close. And Constance, you saw the readout here of, uh, I guess, what we learned during the last Fed meeting, which was, I guess the Fed is pretty much doing what they've told us they were going to do this entire time. Yes, exactly. And I think the only thing that remains in question now is how long is higher for longer, right? Mm -hmm. um, if, you, if you look at the Bloomberg WERP, right, we have a 31% chance of a cut in March, 75% chance of a cut in May. March would really be the same as higher for same, not mm -hmm. higher for longer. Yeah. So it really depends on, on how these financial conditions evolve, mm -hmm. how uh, inflation data evolves, evolves, and how jobs data evolves. Well, let's take two of those pieces of data, the jobs data and the inflation data, which seem to be most important. Based on your own reading of that data, is there a case that the rate hiking cycle is over? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Uh, our base case is not only is the cycle over, but that the first cut will come in March. May. Uh, May. Uh, in May. Okay. Now, personally, I think, and this is not the House view, that there is an increasing chance that it could come in March. And the question is, mm. what would that mean, right? There's an argument out there that if they cut in March, it would be because things have gotten really bad. Mm. I think there's a scenario where in order to stick the soft landing, they're going to have to start getting to neutral. Mm -hmm. They're in restrictive. They're going to have to start getting in neutral. They want to do that in a measured fashion, right? Mm -hmm. 25 basis points a pop. They do not want to be caught behind yeah. having to do 50 or 75 basis points So this points is cuts. less about hitting the gas again and more just taking the foot off the brake. 
and trying to coast to exactly. a, someone. I got you. And ideally, yeah. you know, uh, the economy will stay strong enough that mm -hmm. they could wait until May because I think that will really solidify mm -hmm. the, uh, the lower pressure on inflation. But if we look at the month over month data and we do say a three month annualized rate of the core, we're at 2.6. Mm -hmm. Right. So we're getting into the territory and, and, and how that translates into a PCE that could be acceptable to the Fed. Well, I want to talk a little bit more and game plan out what it would take for the Fed to actually be comfortable moving in March, because you think about what we've heard from the Fed chair and from really uh, all of the policymakers as well. It seems like they're really just drum beating that they're going to stay in restricted territory for some time here and not. And there's this real caution about moving too soon and risking credibility there. What needs to happen? Does the data need to deteriorate or is just the continued trend in lower inflation enough? So I think one of two things, right? If we have a really solid continued trend in inflation, and, and again, what's been sticky here now is core, right? Because we've had this fall in energy prices. So what they're going to need to see is not only a reduction in core, but a reduction in, in core in what they call super core, right? Which is excluding housing. We know with housing, there's this lag. It's, it's known it's about five quarters before what's happening in the actual rental market gets fed through to OER. And so um, they're kind of looking through that and they're looking at this super core inflation. And that has been persistently high because you have things in there like insurance, which rates have gone up pretty significantly since the start of the pandemic. Um, you have other services like transportation services, which have gone up. And so they're going to need to see that really moderate before they're going to move on rates. Alternatively, if we had a severe deterioration in the economic data, that might cause them to move sooner mm -hmm. because that would certainly indicate that, that there's less upward pressure on prices. And let's talk a little bit about the market here, because, of course, uh, on November 1st and in these minutes, you can see a lot of discussion about financial conditions, the idea that tightening financial conditions, it's doing a little bit of the Fed's work for it. But, of course, we've seen just in the past few weeks how quickly that can unravel. How do you think this Fed should be thinking about financial conditions going forward and how that translates into actual monetary tightening? So, of course, the 10-year is the easiest thing to look at, right, because we get a price every second. and, and we know that that translates right on into to mortgage prices, but they'll actually look at a variety of data, right? So they're they're not just looking at the tenure; they're looking at the shape of the yield curve. They're looking at the at the senior loan officer survey, right? Which which indicates that, that we're still in very tight conditions, right? Banks are conserving cash and not lending it out as much, and that is in part because we have this big increase in in interest rates and an inverted yield curve. So they're looking at a broad range of things when they're looking at financial conditions and those are still pretty tight even though we've seen this rally off five percent four and a half is still higher than their september meeting all right constance always great to talk to you constance hunter senior advisor over at macro policy perspectives helping us break down the latest fed minutes and what could potentially come next for the path on rates meanwhile here on the program a close look at what's going on in the crypto sphere with the founder and chief executive of binance agreeing to step down and plead guilty to violating U.S. anti-money laundering requirements. The Department of Justice here in the U.S. scheduled to hold a news conference at the top of the hour that we will bring to you live. Plus, Abercrombie & Fitch raising its 2024 outlook after topping third quarter estimates. We'll speak with CEO Fran Horowitz about the future of the storied retailer. And all eyes right now on NVIDIA. The company is set to announce its earnings after the bell tonight. The AI boom in focus. This is The Close on Bloomberg. marks the official start to the holiday season and our next guest says that we're set for a stock rally. SIBO's Jody Gunsberg writes that given last year's weak performance, it would be, quote, surprising to see another downturn through this holiday given positive sentiment from the Fed's pause on, lower, on rate hikes, lower inflation, and consumer optimism. Thrilled to say Jody joins us on set now. And it's a good point. I mean, you think about last December, what, the S&P 500 is down almost 6%, but December is typically a pretty good time for the equity market. It is. And if we measure 
the returns between Thanksgiving and Christmas, going back to 1983. So that's when SIBO launched the SPX options about 40 years ago. We've seen 30 out of those 40 years be positive, and we've only seen back-to-back -back losses in the holiday season once in 96 and 97. And again, last year, since the drop was 4.5%, we do see a lot of optimism on the back of the Fed's pause and the lingering inflation, given consumers and corporations are continuing to spend from the high rates, that um, there is a good chance of a rally, but that still comes with some risks. Well, Jody, let's talk about this setup heading into this December with those potential risks. Of course, uh, we had seen three straight months of losses, which is fairly rare. Of course, November has been pretty good. And you think about heading into December, what does positioning look like right now, given all that volatility? Yeah, well, we're seeing the rates on the back end right higher for longer, which influences the equity valuations. We're also seeing the possibility of inflation lingering for longer because of the geopolitical risks, the deglobalization, and again, the Fed's pause. And in our risk toolkit, one risk that's standing out is dispersion as measured by our DSPX index. And that means that the fundamentals are overpowering the macro. So we are finding a big split between the winners and the losers in the market. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the dispersion because I feel like that was the big story of the year. I mean, we are sitting on these monster gains on an aggregate basis. But of course, when you look under the hood, there's only a, a small number of companies that are responsible for the majority of those gains. When you look through history and you look at the types of dispersion that we had uh, in previous seasons and, and, and other years here, how much different is it this time? How much more widespread is it? Well, what we're seeing now is that the spread between the winners and the losers, generally about 14% as compared with 9% when there's lower dispersion. So we do see a huge opportunity, about one and a half times higher chance of outperforming the index for active managers. Mm -hmm. So the more active the manager is, like hedge funds that can go long, short, leverage and use derivatives in order to manage that risk, the higher the chance that they'll outperform. Mm -hmm. So I think that right now there is a huge opportunity um, yeah. as compared with other times, except for perhaps like March in 2020 when it was the biggest opportunity ever. Oh, yeah, that, that was like a once in a generation uh, a type of a trading environment. I am curious, though, about the uh, industry breakdown and whether there are certain industries where we are going to see maybe a little bit more dispersion than others. Yeah, we see a lot of opportunities and the winners typically energy and tech. Uh, also, financials and real estate tend to lag when there's high dispersion, though this time I would say energy still has a lot of opportunity because it is most related with inflation. It's inversely related to the dollar, and it's also driven by the fundamental factor, uh, factors, any supply shock. Mm -hmm. So whether that's a geopolitical risk like a war or whether it's a hurricane, those types of influences drive energy companies to perform strongly. Uh, also, real estate may have a good chance of performing well now because of the interest rate environment and the different kinds of real estate available. So mm. whether it's geographically split or it's split by, say, commercial versus residential, we do see that there is an opportunity for the spread there. And Jody, I'm looking at your notes and you write that in times of high dispersion, it's the earnings fundamentals that are more powerful than macro factors. And it feels like, especially this year, we've been talking so much about Fed and global central banks. How are you viewing the tug of war in terms of the driver between earnings versus central banks? It's always difficult to fight the tide. And when there are strong macro factors, it does influence the companies. But again, with these rates on the back end that are higher for longer, that influences the equity valuations. And we also see that there's a lot of opportunity in the fundamental factors at play. So the losers have gotten punished pretty severely this year. Mm -hmm. So that factors in to the high dispersion. That's part of what makes dispersion high. Yeah, and then that, of course, also leads to some of the outsized moves that when they those company when people finally do wake up to and see value in those companies, uh, you start to see those big pops. So this is a great conversation. Uh, great to talk to you. Uh, Jody Gunsberg, head of strategic partnerships over at SIBO. By the way, don't lose the Chicago. I don't know. <laughs> now I'm a Chicago guy. I know you guys want to rebrand and, and make it uh, 
for the rest of the world here, but it'll always be uh, the Chicago uh, board to me. SIBO, uh, strategic head of partnerships there. And Katie uh, Greifeld, back to the dispersion, because I am very fascinated by this, because I mean, I feel like that's going to end up being one of the bigger stories of the year mm -hmm. in terms of uh, just the market returns. And the big question is, do we sort of get a rebalancing of that in 2024? Yeah, it'll be interesting to see, you know, when we wake up in January, early January and come back to our desks, what the mood music is, how we actually settle out. I'm just surprised that we got through this conversation about December. Yeah. Uh, can, excuse me? I, I don't know where you're going. I'm just frowning. Okay. I was My gonna brain. I was going to say in December, we got through that conversation without mentioning a Santa Claus rally, which is coming soon, let me say. <laughs> Well, do you know the official definition? Ask Mike Regan. He's very much a stickler about that. We uh, sit right across from yeah, each other. I heard. But before we get to the Santa Claus rally, coming up, it's a retail roundup. It's another big day for retail earnings reports. We'll have a breakdown next. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Well, a fresh slate of retail results out today. Investors sending shares of Lowe's, Kohl's, and Best Buy lower. But Dick's Sporting Goods higher on strong demand for sports gear. Meanwhile, an exclusive analysis of data by Bloomberg finds that Americans earning at least $100,000 a year are starting to curb their shopping. Joining us now with more is Bloomberg's Matt Townsend. And Matt, walk us through a little bit of the methodology here that you used and what you actually found. Sure, yeah. Our team, we, we looked at, um, we took a group of 30 retailers and brands um, that basically cater to the upper middle class, names like Lululemon um, um, and some other, you know, other, other companies in that, in that patch. And basically what we found is that you know, since about February, um, as a group, they've seen their growth slow down to the point where now it's declining. Um, and if you look at the chart of where overall retail sales are, you know, the, the, the economic numbers reported by the government, those are very steady, even ticking up, while this group is just going down, down, and down. Um, so even like really popular brands or, that are, have been doing well are slowing down, and then just a lot of brands are, are in negative territory. And so we. Yeah. The, so when we talk about the drop, though, are we talking just about just actual total dollar volume? Are we talking about uh, unit sales? I mean, what specifically? Yeah. So we're we're looking at uh, credit card transaction data mm -hmm. uh, through Bloomberg Second Measure, which is a part of Bloomberg. Okay. Um, and so they're tracking a group of consumers every month yeah. um, and doing analysis of that. So that's basically what we're using because this is private companies, this right. is brands within companies that don't actually report yeah. the brand's numbers. Um, things I, like, I just ask that yeah. because, I mean, I mean, when times are good, I mean, there was obviously a lot of distortions by inflation, right? The idea that the total dollar value of sales were going up, but that didn't necessarily mean we were buying more things. It was just those things were costing more. And I'm wondering if there's a reverse effect at all uh, given the disinflationary environment. Uh, th there is some of that, um, and yeah, we you know we've made that point in our reporting uh, sort of throughout, like basically the past few months, that a lot of the growth mm -hmm. in retail sales or at retailers is mostly driven by inflation or largely a bit driven by inflation. Mm -hmm. um, and what we're seeing lately, um, for example, a company like Apple, their retail, um, their average transaction value has actually been falling. Yeah, uh, and their transactions are roughly flat, so that means their sales at like Apple stores, Apple website um, are declining. So it's not, it's not a good sign. Um, if the upper middle class is sort of pulling back, that's the part of the consumer economy that really drives mm -hmm. uh, much of the, of the consumer economy. So that's sort of the scary part here. It's like if the people who can spend aren't spending on discretionary purchases. What right. happens in the fourth quarter? You're right. That's what I was wondering about reading this, of course. Uh, when we think about the impact of the economy, we situate this in the broader economy right now. The yeah. narrative has been for a long time now that the U.S. consumer, maybe sentiment is pretty bad, but they're still spending. And it's interesting to see this segment in particular potentially starting to slow down here. Yeah, that's exactly right. That, you know, the big question mark, I mean, the sort of the trajectory has been, um, we all know what happened during COVID. People splurged on their homes, electronics, clothing. That's shifted to services, you know, like the, the Taylor Swift concerts <laughs> made a lot of noise over the summer. But still, at some point, people need to start buying 
big ticket items, especially in the fourth quarter, was when all these companies are depending on Americans to buy this stuff. So what the data is showing is that even the upper middle class has pulled back. So what's going to happen in the next five weeks? Are they really going to sort of come out of the woodwork, start spending like they haven't been doing for you know better part of a year? We'll see. Um, the data and survey data is also showing a lot of these people in this, this demographic are not very confident right now, worried about their jobs. You know, uh, certain, certain markets of the, uh, certain cities in the country, the, job, the housing market isn't great, prices are sort of dwindling. So there's, there's added pressure on this group, this very important group to the U.S. economy. Well, Matt, I just quickly, I was going to say, uh, you think about some of the earnings reports that we got yeah. just today even. I'm thinking about Best Buy and Lowe's. And uh, it was interesting to see the commentary specifically around uh, big ticket items. And from Best Buy, talking about uneven consumer demand, it seems like this is what they were talking about. Exactly. Yeah, Best Buy was a pretty somber report because their quarter actually each month got worse. The first three, the third, the first three weeks of November, um, do not is not a pretty picture right now for Best Buy. Uh, they called out appliances with big declines, uh, computers, um, all the things that are high consideration that you really think about purchasing. Um, I mean, it's one thing to go into Best Buy and buy a new pair of headphones or something, but this is like you know purchases that are hundreds of dollars. Those are really hurting right now. Yeah. So if that's the sentiment going into like the core holiday shopping season, yeah. what's going to happen, right? I mean, that's... Yeah, the sentiment has definitely uh, shifted yeah. a lot. Matt Townsend, uh, who covers all this uh, for us here at Bloomberg, we got several uh, earnings reports already this week, Katie Greifeld, which I think ratifies exactly what he said, and it really is the setup into what is supposed to be traditionally the big kickoff to the holiday shopping season on Black Friday. Though I feel like Black Friday has kind of lost some of its luster. Yeah, I know. Now yeah. there's Cyber Monday. I feel like there's a Tuesday something holiday. Cyber Monday. I think Tuesday is when we're supposed to like give it all, give back or no, something. No, thank you. I uh, but I <laughs> will wow. say, you think about, uh, again, No charity for you. <laughs> I'm stuck on Best Buy this morning. Again, uneven consumer demand uh, yeah. is a phrase that I think uh, maybe describes what's going on with a lot of retailers right now. And then you bring it back to Lowe's. I mm -hmm. mean, a yep. lot less demand for people redoing their homes, these yeah. home improvement projects. Uh, you think about what a boon that was to a lot of these names yeah. over the last few years, obviously fading now. We're going to get some more retail earnings after the bell tonight, including from Nordstrom as well as Urban Outfitters. A little bit earlier this morning, we got earnings out of Abercrombie and Fitch. And when we come back after the break, we're going to hear from the chief executive officer over at that retailer, Fran Horowitz. She's on deck. This is The Close on Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close here on a holiday shortened week. Volume in the equity market remains relatively subdued as it typically is during this time of year. Let's see if there's any more action going on in the commodity space. Abigail Doolittle, she's standing by right now with our commodities close. There is a bit of action in the commodity space, Romain. We're looking at a third update in a row for the Bloomberg Commodity Index, the longest winning streak uh, in almost a month, the longest winning streak in the month of October. The dollar had been down uh, earlier and yesterday and a few days before. Now slightly higher, but nonetheless overall strength. Take a look at gasoline up ever so slightly, up three tenths of one percent ahead of the big holiday driving uh, weekend. Maybe we'll take a look at a longer term chart of that tomorrow. Heating oil futures up nearly 3% up once again as we do see some colder uh, weather here, at least on the East Coast. Gold up 1.1%. It's not really entirely clear why. It could have been, uh, could be the dollar weakness that we've had. Perhaps some betting that the uh, Fed is done. And then finally, wheat snapping a five-day losing streak. That was the longest losing streak for uh, wheat since August and, of course, down in a major way on the year, Romain. But today we have a little bit of a reprieve for wheat up 2.3%. All right, our thanks there to Abigail. To a little a cl closer look at what's going on in the commodity space, let's now turn to what's been going on in the retail space. Several retail companies reporting earnings, including Abercrombie and Fitch, this morning, raising its 2024 outlook after its third quarter estimates topped. Uh, and topped estimates, I should say. The brand's comeback continues to resonate with teens and young millennials, and the stock up more than 200 percent this year. Investors have high expectations going forward. Pleased to say that the CEO of Abercrombie & Fitch is joining us right now, Fran 
Horowitz. Uh, Fran, let's just talk about, uh, and, and you know, forgive me if this is a wrong phrase, but this has to be a bit of a comeback story here. There were a lot of people that wrote this company off a few years ago. They said time had passed it by. But you, for one reason or another, have managed to sort of tap in a whole new generation of younger people who have now found this brand, and at least based on the results from the last three or four quarters, appear to be really propelling sales forward. Yes, hey, Romain, thanks so much for having me today. Yeah, so just to give a little bit of history, you know, I've joined the company about nine years ago, and we have been on an incredible journey of building both the Abercrombie and the Hollister brands. The Abercrombie brand turnaround um, started quite some time ago. We're in our 11th consecutive quarter of, of positive comps, which is super exciting. Um, and we have really done something very special in the retail industry. We've taken the brands and we've figured out their rightful place in the world. So we put Hollister as the global teen brand, and we aged Abercrombie up. You know, it used to be a, a brand for teens, for jeans and T-shirts, and now it's truly a young millennial brand for that um, that customer, um, a lifestyle brand, say 25 to 30. Mm -hmm. But we've expanded our categories and our age range from 20 to 40 and, and beyond. Uh, when we talk about the sales growth and where it came from here, uh, is the sense here is that there is greater demand uh, for the clothes, or is this just simply kind of a shifting in the spending from one uh, subset of consumers to another? No, the brand is growing very significantly. I mean, the turn started with women's. Women's has actually seen their 13th consecutive quarter of growth. So this is definitely an opportunity for us to take share. I mean, as you know, in the apparel space, it's a game of taking share, and that's exactly what we're exactly what we're doing. The expansion of our categories, you know, out again of jeans and T-shirts and into things like dresses. Um, our Curve Love jeans have been terrific. Our new YPB, which is our active brand, is also tracking very nicely. So definitely taking share. And Fran, I want to talk a little bit more about the aging up of Abercrombie, because I have to admit, I wasn't cool enough to shop at Abercrombie. I was at Hot Topic, just a few stores down. But a lot of my peers shopped at Abercrombie when we were teenagers, and I feel like it's still thought of as a teenage brand. How do you age up and sort of attract that up to 40 category? Well, you know, Kay, it's, it's interesting. It's been an amazing journey. But what we have learned is that the customer is the one who's actually behind us and supporting us. We do a lot of customer research. We stay very close to our customer. When we initially went on this journey, we realized that there's a big white space out there for that young millennial customer. We studied very hard to understand what, you know, what he and she are looking for and decided that the 96-hour weekend, when they are away with their friends, whether that's at weddings or bachelorette parties or just weekends away or even staycations, that we could clothe them for that entire 96 hour vacation. Um, on top of that, we then realized as they started to go back to the office and needed clothing for that too, that we could provide that as well. So we're really a lifestyle brand supporting them for all their different wearing occasions. And as part of that lifestyle component, how much opportunity do you see in perhaps workwear, for example, especially as you target that young millennial? So great question because we have a franchise called the Sloan and that is a trouser pant for women that is absolutely on fire and terrific. We've started delivering it um, about a year ago, and that's exactly what she does with it. She wears it to the office, maybe with a jacket and a top. She takes the jacket off, and she goes out to the bar with her friends or out to dinner. So it's got a multi-purpose to it, and she's really feeling um, very special in it. I am curious about your expectations uh, for the holiday season. I mean, how much, how dependent uh, is Abercrombie & Fitch and its brands uh, on this particular time of the year? Or do you have a little bit more, I guess, of an even dispersion across the uh, full year? Yeah, so as, as Abercrombie has evolved into this older customer, the business is, um, to your point, a little bit more even. Hollister is also um, a little bit more dependent on this time of the year. But Black Friday is an important holiday um, for, for, for both brands, truthfully. And the fourth quarter is our biggest quarter of the year. So we are excited. We are ready to compete. Our inventories are in great shape. You know, we've been running this business on a real um, lean inventory and testing and learning into known winners. And we're ready to go for the fourth quarter. All right, that's a good place to leave it. Fran, really enjoyed this conversation. Our thanks to Fran Horowitz. She is the CEO of Abercrombie & Fitch. I can't believe you weren't cool enough to shop it. No, at no, no, I was like mildly, mildly goth, but we don't have to go into it here. Really? Oh, we do, kind of. We have to talk about oh. NVIDIA, though, because NVIDIA, it's right. out with quarterly results after the closing bells. Can the AI juggernaut deliver another stellar report? We'll preview what to expect next. This is The Close on Bloomberg.
Let's get a view from the sell side with our top calls. Big movers on the back of analyst recommendations. And we start off with Six Flags, a downgraded neutral over at Rosenblatt with the analyst saying the increase in more volatile and less predictable weather patterns is raining on the theme parks parade. The analyst does say that the Six Flags merger with Cedar Fair may mitigate some of the weather uncertainty by creating a more diverse geographic footprint. Shares fractionally lower on the day. Next up, let's take a look at the candy maker Hershey. RBC Capital Markets ditching its outperform rating and going down to sector perform. The analyst says, forget Ozempic, the real threat for Hershey. Macro conditions, rising input costs for sugar and cocoa, and growing momentum from its rivals, including Mars. Those shares down about 1.5% on the day. And finally, C3AI getting an upgrade today to outperform over at Oppenheimer and a new price target at 40 bucks a share. The analyst says the AI theme is, quote, real and durable. And C3 AI is one of the few players helping customers drive revenue and productivity. He also says the company can actually accelerate growth heading into 2025. The shares accelerating up 2% on the day. Those are some of our top calls. We do want to stick in the sell side space and stick with AI with NVIDIA set to report results tonight after the bell. Artificial intelligence has driven the market value to new heights with the average price target at almost $650 a share. NVIDIA right now trading just around 500. Raymond James analyst Srini Pajuri joining us right now. He has a strong buy rating uh, on the company as well as a $600 uh, price target. All right, Srini, let's start off with the expectations here because obviously we talk about uh, a trillion dollar market cap, uh, uh, the best performing stock in the S&P 500, a P.E. ratio on a forward basis that I think is approaching 50. And of course, triple digit revenue growth over the last couple of quarters. Is the bar heading into this earnings report too high? Yeah, I would say the bar is not low, but I think the demand is also very strong right now. Uh, demand is continuing to outpace supply of GPUs, and our expectation is that you know it's going to be a pretty decent quarter. Uh, what we said in, in our preview is that they're probably going to beat about five to ten percent and raise the outlook by about five to ten percent. And and just one correction. Uh, on a forward basis, the stock is not trading at 50 times. It's actually uh, the, the multiple has come in quite a bit. It's actually trading around 30 times. Uh, historically, this is a stock that traded at roughly 40 times on average. Hmm. OK, well, thank you for that correction. I am curious, uh, Ashrini, about uh, sort of the direction going forward longer term here. I know that they're going to have some big numbers over the next couple of quarters. Uh, but the expectation is at some point that has to sort of moderate just by default here. Where does NVIDIA stand right now in the AI space and specifically with uh, profiting off of uh, the big AI boom? Yeah, you know, they're the biggest beneficiary right now. Um, and if you look at the, uh, the, the, the revenue from AI, um, I think this year we're modeling roughly $40 billion. And next year, our model is roughly $65 billion plus or minus. Maybe that's even uh, somewhat conservative. Uh, our view is that the demand will continue to outpace supply uh, throughout next year. So um, you're right. I think at some point we have to take a pause. You know, the cloud customers, the likes of Microsoft and Amazon, uh, they'll have to take a pause and they'll kind of think about, you know, how they generate the returns on these investments. And there's always always going to be some digestion period. But at the same time, you know, this is a mega trend. Uh, I think this is a multi-year trend. And uh, our expectation is that even if there is a pause, it's going to be temporary. It's probably a one to two quarter pause and we're back to the races again. So one to two quarter pause coming. And like you said, I mean, your view is that this is a mega trend, that that'll just be a pause. But heading into the earnings report uh, approaching in just a couple of hours or so, you think about the stock up 242 percent year to date. I mean, how little is the margin for error heading into that that report and that call especially? Yeah, I, you know, look, the margin for error with high multiple stocks is always very, very high. Uh, but at the same time, we feel comfortable that the short term numbers are going to be good. One concern in recent weeks has been their China business. Obviously, the U.S. government has uh, implemented, rolled out new export controls. And as a result, NVIDIA cannot ship their AI products, uh, at least the current AI products into China. So that's going to have some impact uh, down the road. But the management came out and said that in the short term, they don't see much of an impact, even you know, with those restrictions going into place, because the demand from outside of China is so strong. I think some customers are still waiting to get their hands on GPUs for a long, long time. And uh, I think, you know, that trend 
is what gives us comfort that even though, yeah, the bar is quite high, I think they'll be able to meet and beat. Let's talk about geopolitics a little bit more. Of course, you bring up what's happening with China. And uh, it seems like at this point, again, hearing from company management, the current state of tensions is manageable. But you think about sort of the long term geopolitical risks here. How are you factoring that into some of your models when you're trying to analyze this company? Yeah, I mean, today, I would say China is roughly 20 to 25 percent of their data center business. And, and then look, China is a big market, not just for NVIDIA, but every U.S. semiconductor company. And obviously, AI, you know, is very strategic for U.S. and it's very sensitive. So I know there are restrictions. Uh, but at the same time, NVIDIA has implemented workarounds in the past, and there is speculation that they might try to do that again. Um, outside of AI, NVIDIA has a strong presence in China in gaming as well. So they have they have a pretty pretty you know uh, good exposure there. So and and you know geopolitics can change anytime, right? I mean, yeah, in in the short term, uh, you know, they won't be able to ship what they have today. But longer term, I don't see them you know uh, getting out of China completely. I think they will be a key player there. And uh, they'll, of course, comply with the U.S. regulations. But even while complying, I think they still have an opportunity. I think, you know, the, ch the Chinese customers, uh, there is, you know, some domestic uh, development of AI chips, but yeah. those chips are going to be so far behind. Uh, I think NVIDIA will still have a role to play there. All right, Srini, going to have to leave it there. Srini Pajuri over at Raymond James, a preview of maybe what we hear tonight out of NVIDIA. We do want to stay on AI and refocus on OpenAI and Sam Altman. Eric Gordon, assistant professor at the University of Michigan, he's stopping by to discuss, well, some of the corporate governance issues that led to the ouster of Sam Altman and maybe potentially his return. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. It's time now for our Wall Street Week daily segment. The host of Wall Street Week, David Weston, joins us every day around this time. And David, as we speak, uh, Bloomberg reporters are reporting that there's actually negotiations now between Sam Altman and the board of OpenAI to bring him back. What happened to Humpty Dumpty? I don't know. Remember, I, I, they put I'm him back confused. together or not? This yeah. is amazing. Yeah. It's an amazing drama. It started late Friday, as mm -hmm. you know, but it still yeah. continues right now. Mm -hmm. We don't know where it's going to play out. But to take us through how we got here and what went wrong for that matter, we welcome now Eric Gordon. He's assistant professor at the University of Michigan Ross School of Business. Eric, thank you so much for being with us. Let me start with one of the most basic questions. Is this yet another instance of a lot of money in a high-tech startup going awry, as we've seen before in different situations, or is a AI really central to this drama? I think it's both, David. I think AI is central, but in some ways it's just another what were they thinking story. All of these brilliant people, you know, like probably eight Sigma smart people with billions of dollars doing something which in retrospect makes no sense. And I think if they had paid attention up front, prospectively it made no sense. Well, Eric, uh, a lot of those people are very smart, no question about it. They tend to be scientists rather than uh, corporate leaders, uh, and they haven't had a lot of experience. Microsoft doesn't fit in any of those categories. They made a really big investment in this. How could they have done that without their due diligence saying, you know what, we've got sort of a governance issue here? Well, you know, I, you know, I teach m and I, I talk a lot about due diligence with students. They would have gotten probably a D minus for uh, this episode. But there's another possibility that I wonder about. Is it another Microsoft is behind story? So you'll remember Microsoft was behind. You know, Bill Gates wasn't sure the internet was going to be big. So they were behind in browsers. They were behind in search. They were behind in the cloud. They were behind in AI. Maybe it's just Microsoft throwing its money around part four. Well, it's certainly possible. I mean, at least for right now, it looks like they might actually manage to stick the landing on this. But I am curious uh, why we have sort of had to go through all this. When you hear uh, about the founder being ousted by a board that, at least based on what we know publicly, there was no real cons consultation with the big investors, including Microsoft. Yeah, Romain, it's kind of interesting because all of the things that we think about in all of the oust the CEO battles, all the takeover battles, don't really apply here because of the peculiar nature of the companies. So the company that Altman got ousted from is a 
capped profit company that is controlled by a not-for-profit company. It's not controlled by directors who are venture capitalists, our business people. They're, we don't have activist hedge funds. The usual players who know how business is done, it isn't in play here. It's a not-for-profit board that ousted him. Mm -hmm. And they said, you know, look, our mission comes before what you're trying to do. You've known that all along. We've made it perfectly clear. But you keep trying to do what you want to do, and we want you to stay on mission. Well, is that not fair? I mean, after all, I mean, Sam Altman was there at the genesis of this structure. Yeah, I mean, he actually set up. He was one of the people who set up the uh, the nonprofit that's on the top of the control pyramid here. But I'm not sure that the uh, not-for-profit people are entirely free of responsibility because, well, they they went out and they accepted you know, $12 billion or so of Microsoft money. They got into a venture that they knew would require billions and billions of dollars. That's orders of magnitude bigger than the kind of money you raise in a typical nonprofit. So, Eric, they may not be full of responsibility, but what about power? Because the way it's structured it appears it is a self perpetuating, I believe, nonprofit board. They pick their own people. They basically answer to themselves. I believe at least the founding documents have it that the basic purpose is the good of humanity, I think is the way it's put. So, how do you fix this situation if they don't want to go with what uh, Microsoft wants to do? I think everybody has a choice. The foundation can say we're going to stick with safe AI for everybody in humanity, or we can bend a little on that and have Altman back or somebody like Altman. We can continue to attract billions of dollars to build AI or not. Um, and Altman has a decision to make. Uh, does he want to go back? Or would he rather be at Microsoft where it's a business for profit, build it big, take over the world, rather than do good for the world? Eric, you referred to the billions of dollars. Uh, is that an essential uh, sort of constraint on what the nonprofit board might want to do? Do they need more billions of dollars? And if the investors basically, existing or future, say, we're not going to play with you, does that really limit what they can do going forward? I think that's exactly right. I don't think you can build AI. This is one of the things, the special things about AI that you mentioned earlier. It's going to require more billions of dollars to continue to build out AI. It will probably take billions of dollars year after year because you constantly have to build the database that drives the AI. It's kind of a bad fit for a nonprofit. I mean, it's a good idea. Let's have nice, friendly, non-dangerous AI. But realistically, how are you going to do that without taking money from people who don't have the same mission? Yeah, exactly right. That's a great question. Thank you so much, Eric. That's Eric Gordon. He's clinical assistant professor at the University of Michigan Ross School of Business. So I guess one of my questions is, when are we going to learn? It seems like we go through these things again yeah. and again and again. Do we ever learn the lessons of the last one? I, I do wonder. I am curious about the structure, though, because I mean, we talk about the cap, uh, maybe in a cap profit company, too. But the idea that it did start off as a complete nonprofit, and they made that decision uh, in 2019 to go to that cap profit structure. So there clearly was somebody who had an awareness of, as, as Professor Gordon pointed out, the billions of billions of dollars that was necessary to move this thing forward, and they had to change the structure in some way. And Elon Musk was one of the co-founders yeah. originally, and he bailed out when they yeah. made that change. Because yes. he said, I thought this was supposed to be nonprofit, it's supposed to be for the good of humanity. Yeah. Now you're going the commercial way. And so yeah. it was flagged. But it, it raises the question though, how do you how do you build out something like this that is so costly with and trying to do it in a way where basically there is no sharing of the riches that maybe come along with it. Who's going to give you those billions? Yeah, at the same time, yeah. some people are saying it could be the end of humanity. Yeah. <laughs> there is that, you know? <laughs> it sounds a little scary. Well, okay. As long as the lawyers do okay. <laughs> exactly. Well, the lawyers always do okay. That's a basic rule. Okay, tomorrow, JCPenney CEO Mark Rosen will be here to talk with Romaine Bostic in advance of that Black Friday. And then on Friday, we're going to present some of the best interviews of the year so far, including Fed Chair Jay Powell, GE CEO Larry Culp, and former head of the Council of Economic Advisors, that's Dr. Cecilia Rouse. That's coming up next on Friday on Wall Street Week at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. All right. Always one of the highlights of the week, Wall Street Week every Friday. And David joins us every day around this time for our Wall Street Week daily segment. As we say goodbye to him, we round out into the final hour of trading here on this Tuesday afternoon. Volume relatively light in this holiday shortened week. Stocks on the back foot. We'll be back in a moment. This is The Close on Bloomberg.
Just about 3 p.m. here in New York. This is the countdown to the close. Let's get a view from the top. I'm Romaine Boston. And I'm Katie Greifeld. We're going to check in on the markets in just one second. But right now, we are awaiting a press conference from the U.S. Department of Justice. This relates to a story that Bloomberg reported earlier today that the, the founder and chief executive officer at Binance Holdings, Chang Bing Zhao, has pleaded guilty to anti-money laundering violations and agreed to pay a $50 million fine. This is a sweeping deal worked out with the Justice Department, which is actually designed to keep the company operating. Now, there are some conflicting details here, Katie, as to far as uh, what role a CZ will actually have in this company uh, on the back of this deal here. But as you can see there, right there on the screen, we are waiting for Merrick Garland, uh, the Attorney General of the United States, as well as uh, some of the other folks who are working on this case to take the podium and explain exactly what happened. Yeah, some questions about what role CZ will play, but but the understanding at the moment is that, of course, Binance will be able to continue operating. Of course, we're talking mm -hmm. about the world's biggest crypto exchange right now. And checking in on the crypto world, there seems to be some relief that that yeah. exchange isn't getting shut down necessarily. And we should also point out, just a clarification too, based on Bloomberg reporting, so the $50 million is what CZ himself would mm -hmm. have to pay. Binance, the company, uh, is agreeing to plead guilty to criminal charges and pay a $4.3 billion fine. This is according to people familiar with the matter that Bloomberg reporters have spoken to. We'll check back in on that press conference as soon as it starts, but let's get to what's been going on in the broader U.S. equity markets, and it's a whole lot of nothing here. We should point out volume about 20 percent below where it would normally be at this time on the holiday shortened week, and some of the gains that we had over the last few days peeled back just a bit, just fractionally, two-tenths of a percent lower, Katie, on the S&P. Yeah, a pretty quiet day in the equity market, a pretty quiet day, too, in the bond market. I mean, you take a look at 10-year yields right now. They're camped out at about 441, only down about less than a basis point or so. So really settling into holiday trading. But we yeah. do have some data tomorrow maybe to get excited about. I want to talk about the VIX for a second. Maybe we can flip up the board. You see it there, 13, Talk about excitement. Here. Yeah, I, I know there's all this the discussion about whether the VIX is even the proper read anymore uh, on volatility, whether that's been usurped by one day, zero day options and all these other things here. But I mean, the, the drop that we've seen in that, uh, in that at least one measure here is, is quite extraordinary here, and Dan Curtis had put together a great chart. Here it goes, right here. Uh, just taking a look at the one-day VIX here, so you get a better sense here of just how much. I mean, this is astonishing, and uh -huh. it raises the question, is this actually an accurate reflection of how people feel right now about forward volatility, or is this more a reflection of people just not using this as the main mechanism uh, for hedging volatility? Some big, hefty questions. I'm not sure if I can answer them. Oh. But when it comes to both the one-day VIX and the classic VIX, yeah. if you will, I would say the most exciting thing about them right now is just seeing how low they can go. I mean, you look at a VIX with a 13 handle. Are we going to break 10 at some point? I don't know. But uh, in any case, maybe we should talk about some of the individual movers because yeah. there is some action there. Of course, we've been talking about retail all day. We're going to do it more right now because it is retail earnings season. I have three earnings stories for you. Let's talk about Best Buy. We chat a little bit about it earlier in the day. Same store sales fell by more than expected. That has been the theme of this earnings season. But unlike maybe some of the other retailers that we've already heard from, Best Buy isn't expected to be able to maintain its profitability. It really cut its outlook on multiple measures. You can see that in the stock right now. Yeah, the Best Buy earnings were not good. I mean, let's no. just let's just put it flat out. And it really raises the question here about certain types of retailers and where they fit into the retail space. If you're just a reseller, and I know Best Buy has made a lot of decisions to try to get people in the store with uh, you know, having the actual uh, company companies themselves, staff it themselves. Uh, but I don't know if that's going to be enough. And then you had another one on the board there. I feel like Kohl's is going through something similar. Kohl's. Let's talk about Kohl's. Uh, seventh straight drop in comparable sales. Again, this theme of same store sales just not being able to live up to expectations. And Kohl's, it has had some success when it comes to its excess inventory, when it comes to cutting costs. But again, that sales growth that investors are really looking for right now, it just hasn't been able to deliver that. And I mean, you look at the wipeout in shares yeah. down almost 10%. Uh, and, and, I they mean, have, and they're having management changes and yeah. other things. There's a lot going on there. Yeah, a lot going on. And, of course, a Kohl's is different from a Best Buy. It's different from a Lowe's. But, again, it's all 
the same similar story. Lowe's, it cut its forecast a second time this year. It also sees same store sales dropping 5%. Previously, Lowe's had been uh, expecting a decline about 2% to 4%, that sort of range. Now it's seeing something worse than that. And we were talking about this a little bit earlier. Uh, part of the story for Lowe's is that people are renovating their homes less often mm. right now. And yeah. uh, big ticket demand, it just isn't there in the same way that it has been. Absolutely. And I think that's going to be a big part of the story. By the way, I just had to look up because you said the VIX could break below 10. I was just curious the last time the VIX traded in double digits. This is the pop quiz, Katie. Don't cheat. I know you cheat on the weekly quiz. I was about when was the last time the VIX traded in the single digits? I don't know. I'm going to say over a decade ago. No, well, not that long ago. It was actually uh, early 2018. I feel like I yeah. should have said that. Actually. Yeah, it was that early, early 2018, and then 2017 was just a, a monster. I, I think it was down at eight or something uh, like that here. Makes you think. Okay, um, we'll have another pop quiz later for uh, Katie Ryfield. See if she can redeem herself and get her grade. <laughs> point average back up to, I guess, what, 50%? <laughs> that's still, like that's still that. an F. Uh, all right. We continue our coverage, though, here on The Close, counting you down to those bells. And there was an interesting note out uh, by the folks over at uh, Bank of America. Savita Subramanian sees a fresh high for the S&P 500 next year. She's expecting the benchmark to close at a record 5,000 by the end of next year. That call is actually in line with a lot of other companies on Wall Street, including Goldman, including Sockchain, even Morgan Stanley, which are really starting to turn much more constructive uh, for the next year uh, for the aggregate uh, U.S. equity market. Let's see what our next guest has to say about this. Michael Aroni joining us, chief investment strategist over at State Street Global Advisors. And Michael, everyone is kind of upping their forecast, I think, uh, for into next year. And arguably, I can understand why. But there is sort of a question here about the big rally we had and what actually is the catalyst that would add to those gains in a meaningful way in 2024. Romain, I think it's interesting. I think 2023's caution has turned into 2024's courage. And that makes me a little nervous. So I think the, the big things this year were that expectations headed into this year were incredibly low. And everything surpassed those very low expectations. And the other thing to think about is that after years of easy monetary policy and massive fiscal stimulus, those help the economy remain resilient. Next year, I think those tailwinds will, in fact, finally become headwinds. So I do think those are two big risks for 2024, is that expectations are much higher. And I'm not sure that if we remove the crutches of monetary and fiscal policy from this economy, Mm -hmm. Will it be able to stand on its own two feet? So those, I think, are the risks as we kind of hurl, hurtle towards 2024. I, I am curious then about uh, kind of what is sort of uh, wagging the dog here. There's been so much discussion about uh, the correlation with yields, a negative correlation, I should say, particularly with real yields and equities, as well as the correlations with the dollar and how that has been a big driver, at least on a day-to-day -day basis, of some of the gains that we've seen in the equity market. Romain, I think the fascinating thing here, and this could be a silver lining for the risks I just outlined, is exactly you and Katie were just talking about the VIX and how complacent it is. All the action's been on the bond side of things. And what's been really interesting is real interest rates climbed during the summer and 10 years got to you know roughly 5%. We saw markets sold off. It was a sea of red. Even the Magnificent Seven struggled. Bond market volatility explained about two-thirds of stock market dispersion over the last six months or so. Wow. Those are numbers that we rarely see, about 15 times in the last 70 years. And here's the silver lining for you, Romain, that's interesting, is that when stock market volatility, excuse me, bond market volatility explains that much of stock market dispersion, it's actually a bullish sign. And typically value stocks and small cap stocks are the things that rally. So in order to sustain this market's advance, we need something beyond the Magnificent Seven. The good news anyway is historically when bond market performance explains this much of stock market performance, it's been a bullish sign and the market could broaden out. So perhaps that'll help Savita's call for the, for the very strong next year in 2024. Well, Michael, if it's been bond volatility that's really been driving what we're seeing in the equity market, let me ask the obvious question, which is, have we seen peak rates fall? I think we may have, and that's actually, Katie, what will drive the positive performance, because this volatility in, in interest rates and bond markets won't last forever. So you're talking about three years, three, a run of three years for Treasury bonds that are the worst we've seen in 100 years. So what typically happens next? Well, that bond mar market volatility, that interest rate volatility normalizes. 
And as it normalizes, stocks typically rally. And I think that's what we're seeing. And if you think about the rally since the CPI number came out last week, and that was a big day for Russell 2000, what actually has happened is Russell 1000 values outperformed Russell 1000 growth and small cap stocks have rallied. So almost right on cue, as bond market volatility normalizes, those parts of the markets tend to do pretty well. And that's what we're seeing. Banks in particular in the last week, financials, kind of unusually have been strong. Uh, and, and so I think this is actually kind of an interesting sidebar to the conversation about the economy and, mm -hmm. and the Fed and fiscal policy. And anyway, at least when this settles down, it's been bullish for stock markets in the past. So that's what normalizing bond vol means for equities. Let's talk about what it just means for the bond market, though. If we actually have seen peak rates, peak rates volatility, how are you thinking about fixed income in a portfolio right now, especially relative to equities? I think you need to barbell on fixed income. So as rates continue to remain high, I think having kind of a shorter maturities on that end of the yield curve kind of your one to three month, your three to 12 month treasury bills, your money market fund like investments makes a lot of sense. You're capturing north of 5%. So of the nearly 5.7 trillion in money, money, money market fund assets, more than 70% now yield higher than 5%. So having a good or above average allocation to that makes sense. Low volatility, low correlation to stocks, low correlation to interest rates and credit risk, and you got plenty of liquidity and lower volatility. However, yeah. if rates fall, Katie, we get reinvestment risk. So we need to balance that reinvestment risk as rates fall with something else. We think kind of intermediate corporate bonds, intermediate treasuries are where the most attractive part is on the yield curve, where we can capture similar yields, but will benefit should rates fall if the economy slows and inflation slows and the Fed is in fact done, that should help some of those intermediate treasuries and intermediate corporate bond uh, allocations benefit as yields fall, yeah. prices will rise. Do you see any meaningful danger, any meaningful risk, I should say, uh, Michael, with locking in uh, some of those higher rates? I mean, I know on the surface it looks attractive, but if economic conditions do change, what risk does that pose? I think the biggest risk is if, in fact, we are at a higher real rate environment, which the market clearly thinks we're not. So you can see that real rates have started to come in. The Fed, the markets believe that the Fed is done. Um, I don't know if they over tighten, but the market believes the Fed is done. And what's really contributing to that is that the Fed has only raised rates once since their June FOMC meeting. They've stood pat in three out of the last four meetings. So the market's saying the Fed is, in fact, done. So the idea here is the risk to bond market allocations, particularly longer maturity bond allocations, is if real rates were to continue to rise, I'm not sure that's the case. I think it's more likely that they fall. So I think that is kind of the bigger risk uh, to those longer term allocations. All right, Michael, really enjoyed this conversation. Hope to check in with you again soon. That is Michael Aroni. He is chief investment strategist over at State Street Global Advisors. Now coming up, Sam Altman and members of the OpenAI board have opened negotiations aimed at a possible return of the ousted co-founder and CEO. We'll bring you the latest. And we're on watch for NVIDIA's earnings coming up after the bell tonight. The company riding the AI boom. How much longer can it last? Plus, we'll have more on the future of Binance after the CEO agrees to step down plead guilty and pay a $50 million fine. U.S. officials about to hold a news conference. We'll bring that to you live. All that and more coming up. This is The Close on Bloomberg. A bit of a stock picker's market with 44 minutes until the closing bell. Some of your favorites, favorites are solidly in the green here on the day, including Alphabet, Visa, Medtronic, and a few others. But you got quite a few of the other big cap tech names also moving lower here on the day. That includes Apple, and yes, it includes Microsoft as well. You put it all together, and the net effect of it all is a market that is relatively unchanged. Take everything that you see today with a bit of a grain of salt, as we should point out. Volume is light, as is typical during uh, the Thanksgiving holiday week here. The S&P 
2,500, lower by about two tenths of a percent here on the day. But you are seeing some interesting individual stories. We're going to talk a lot about AI today as we await word here on whatever the heck is going on with OpenAI and Sam Altman. We're going to get NVIDIA earnings later tonight. And we've already gotten some earnings out of some other AI companies that show that the AI hype it actually has a lot of substance behind it. Take a look at Symbiotic here, up 37% here on the day. This is a maker, kind of a, think uh, kind of a warehouse and warehouse uh, type of uh, automation, those types of robots. They've been doing AI before it was cool here. They came out with earnings that showed there was a huge uptake here from new customers coming online, looking to take advantage of their technology. That's a big part of the reason why you're seeing the shares higher on the day. And believe it or not, at 37, 38%, that's not even close to its best day ever. It had a 50% run up uh, on one day back in mid-July. On watch, of course, for NVIDIA earnings after the bell, but let's go now down to Abigail Doolittle, who's standing by right now with our Options Insight. Abigail. Oh, well, Romaine, you know, we've had this massive rally. Maybe not so much today. We're cooling off just a little bit, but over the last three weeks, more than three weeks, these indexes up, stock indexes up uh, 6 to 12 percent. Uh, some of the trends look a little bit parabolic. It seems as though the markets are really trading as though they are pricing in a determined Fed pivot that the Fed will not be hiking anymore and that they might be uh, even cutting. But the Fed, even in those recent mo uh, minutes, not indicating that so much. Alone Rosen, head of institutional equity derivatives at Oppenheimer. Great to have you with us. And, you know, it's hard to match the narratives again to the stock trading that we're seeing, or it feels like the net narratives are, are trying to make sense of it, but maybe not matching uh, the reality quite so much. But I'm hearing so much about these CTAs and the role of uh, the CTAs in this recent rally, what you're calling upside chase. Hey, Abigail, uh, great to be back. And uh, you nailed it. It's been, a, again, a, a case of sentiment positioning and really positioning that drove this rally higher from the lows in late October. Uh, many people were not long. Uh, the short base built up, uh, CTA specifically, and the number was as high as 70 billion bought of U.S. equities from that community alone, uh, flipping from the short side to the long side. So that's been a big bid and, uh, I guess, an upside driver where there hasn't been much merchandise to sell all the way up. So we're hitting a kind of an area here where what's going to be the next catalyst. But on the flip side, it's also hard to see what's going to cause us to collapse, you know, 5, 10 percent again like we did in October. So let's talk about that possible next catalyst, because really leading the way technology, in particular, that uptrend, especially if it's stretched out over a three, four, five year chart, it looks absolutely parabolic as though it's going to have to consolidate uh, in some way. What do you see for technology? And to my memory, the quarters were sort of mixed. The fundamentals here just don't match the degree to which investors really are chasing uh, this FOMO. You know, there's a lot of talk on valuations, and many people think that it's actually cheap if you go further out, if you look further factor in the growth. But investors aren't buying these stocks on valuation. They want to be there. The Magnificent Seven, I believe the concentration hit the highest in the last 50 years of the mega cap stocks. You have the 10 largest stocks of the SPX, around 35 percent. That exceeds any level going back to the 70s of the Nifty 50. So we're hitting that crowded uh, factor again. If you look at NVIDIA's last quarter, they blew out the numbers. But from a positioning perspective, it was so-called 100 percent crowded long. Uh, es estimates now are currently closer to 80 to 85 percent long positioning wise. So maybe it could get that extra legs if they do blow out again. But this is clearly going to lead the next uh, next leg uh, up or down based on NVIDIA's response to the numbers. Yeah, that's a great point. NVIDIA really is probably going to drive the sentiment and uh, the markets in a large way. So, of course, seasonally, I know that this week and maybe next week, the next two weeks can be a little bit difficult. But typically, people think about the year end as being uh, more bullish and at the end of the month into the new year, a possible Santa Claus rally. I believe you're saying that if you're long, stay long, but it's time to put on a hedge, that vol is very cheap. The main theme on our desk right now is vol. Implied vols are too cheap relative to realized volatility. Uh, they're giving you a lot of opportunities to gain exposure on both the upside and downside using options. Uh, we're getting around a 25% discount on current implied volatility versus what it's been realizing over the last, uh, I guess you can say, one to three months. And we like uh, using a QQQ hedge. If you're long tech stocks, nobody wants to sell anything and take gains. So the way to protect yourself and maybe gain some capital on the downside is use a December 22nd one by one put spread on the triple Q. Uh, it's currently trading around 388 and change. You're paying 315 on that uh, trade. It's around a four and a half times payout for approximately a four and a half percent decline, which we think could be 
a surprise move. No one's expecting uh, any decline here. There's absolutely no fear in the market. And options are just cheap right now. So we, we find it better than using short stock and applying these type of uh, protection trades. It's so hard to believe that there's no fear in the market alone, although that's clearly the case, given the fact that especially this next catalyst, NVIDIA, up about 240% this year, price to perfection. Let's see if they put it up in just about 40 minutes or so. Alone Rosen, head of institutional equity derivatives over at Oppenheimer. Thanks for joining us for Options Insight today. And from New York, this is Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. 30 minutes left to go here in the trading day. And it's a pretty quiet one, but not too many gains, especially if you're looking at the S&P 500 at the broad level, down slightly right now. You take a look at the sector level. You do actually have some green to chew on right now. The healthcare uh, sector up about 7 tenths of a percent. Materials, consumer staples up as well, but really small moves here. You take a look at what's not working too well today. Again, small moves overall, but consumer discretionary real estate uh, down today. And then tech on the bottom here, that sector off by about eight tenths of a percent. I have some pretty important earnings remain. Still a stock pickers story, a stock pickers a day here. And of course, these individual stories are about earnings. The two biggest gainers, uh, the gainer, I should say, the two biggest movers in the S&P 500 today on the upside and to the downside. Two names that we don't typically talk about, Agilent and Jacobs Engineering, going in completely opposite directions, but for very similar reasons. And that's really about where business spending and CapEx spending is going. Obviously, the story much more focused on tech, less on infrastructure, and at least that's the split you're seeing today. Dick Sporting Goods and American Eagle also indicative of the split that we're starting to see in the retail space as well. American Eagle down 16 percent on the day, dealing with a lot of the same issues that we heard from some of the other retailers. Meanwhile, Dick's, they're saying well, they're not having that same problem. And maybe this has to do with the idea of what actually is discretionary and what for some families, Katie, is a consumer staple. Well, let's go from the stock market over to crypto and get the latest on the future of Binance after the CEO agrees to step down plead guilty and pay a $50 million fine. Of course, we are awaiting U.S. officials about to hold a news conference. And as we await that, Bloomberg's Shanali Bassett joins us now. And Shanali, just lay this out for us because we're both talking about the Binance CEO and we're also talking about the exchange itself pleading guilty here. Yeah, we certainly are. And according to people familiar with the matter, that fine for Binance alone is more than $4 billion. That is certainly one of the largest fines we have seen come out of the crypto industry. Now, remember, this is in regard to the Department of Justice, the Treasury Department, the CEO. FTC's own investigations, the big open question is what does the SEC do? They have their own suits against Binance. Binance will continue to operate as an exchange. Remember, it is the world's largest crypto exchange, but it will operate without CZ as the CEO. Mm. So that's a big question. Of course, he was a pivotal member of the crypto community here. What does it mean for him to not be running this exchange? You see it in the price of the BNB token. It really did take a hit after today's news. Was Is he retaining ownership, Shanali? That, according to the Wall Street Journal, he will be retaining ownership as well of yeah. Binance. So how is that a penalty? I mean, I understand that, okay, it, I mean, that's kind of like saying, well, okay, I get to keep all the money and not have to do any of the work. I mean, yeah. why is this a penalty? Th that's a very yeah. serious question here. You have to remember that he was not based in the United States. And uh, the extradition treaty was definitely in question here when they were getting to the was settlement. Was it not really based here? I mean, and I don't mean him specifically, but I mean the company as a whole, because this is always sort of, a, I, I guess, kind of a, the little peekaboo game that they would play is that, well, we're really not domained anywhere, so we're not really beholden to anyone's particular laws. And we know that kind of was always a fallacy here. But the structure of this company with what was Binance US at one point and then now the overall Binance, how does that structure, if at all, change as a result of the settlement? No, that's a great question. If you think about Binance, if, if crypto is global. Yeah. The fact that it wasn't in the United States was a big thing. They had an entity that had its name, Binance US, uh, in the United States that you know had a very murky relationship also with the parent company. They were not quite related. But when you look at Binance in itself, to your point, he still keeps a stake in Binance. So financially, he, generally fine, but $4 billion less, I guess, with the settlement. But to but, your but point. But according to our reporting, he is admitting to, and I'm just want to be is, careful in the wording, yes. but our reporting at Bloomberg to 
anti-money laundering violations. That's correct? Correct. Okay. And that's the very important part of this, the pleading yeah. guilty of it all. The, another kind of a parallel that was drawn was what happened at BitMEX, for example, where uh, the BitMEX yeah. founder did not go to jail on the back mm -hmm. of a lot of, uh, you know, related findings. Right. And there was a guilty plea, but he was able to avoid prison time on the heels of that guilty plea. So the sentencing for Binance's CEO will be a very interesting moment as well to see what kind of actual penalties there could be coming out of this suit. And of course, before we get there, we are waiting this press conference due to start soon. Uh, so we've talked about the future of CZ, potentially, of course, still a lot of questions there. But talk about the future of Binance, because this is an exchange that's still going to operate. And I mean, as you've laid out, this is the world's biggest crypto exchange. This is uh, existentially important to the crypto industry as it functions now. Yeah, it certainly is. And it's worth talking about kind of the bigger picture here. You have the SEC cracking down on exchanges uh, from Binance to Kraken to Coinbase. And we'll be speaking a little later to Coinbase's CEO just about this. The SEC's cracked down. Something interesting to think about, Katie, is just how much people have moved away from kind of on exchange mm -hmm. crypto activity to DeFi. That has been a big case for DeFi, and you're seeing a lot of venture money to the extent that it's not um, so hurt from the fallout of FTX going into DeFi now instead. I am curious, too, uh, you know, and I don't want to get too much into his personality, but he took a lot of victory laps when SBF was taking the blows, even prior to the trial, when just his downfall. And he was very vocal and very explicit, and I just went to look at some of the other stories about saying that he, there were no issues at Binance. That this was specifically about FTX and Alameda and what SBF was doing here. Based on what we know, and I know there's still a lot we don't know about the charges, but based on what we know, is there a sense here that this was a much broader problem than what was going on at FTX? Hold that thought for one second, Shanali. Let's go down to Merrick Garland. He's the Attorney General of the United States, uh, joined uh, on stage uh, by uh, several folks, including Treasury Secretary uh, Janet Yellen, to talk today okay. about the Okay, good settlement. afternoon. I'm joined today by Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco, and CFTC Chairman Russ Benham. We are here today to announce that the Justice Department has secured felony guilty pleas from the world's largest cryptocurrency exchange, Binance, and from its founder and CEO, Changpeng Zhao, also known as CZ. Separate from the criminal enforcement actions, the Justice Department is announcing today Secretary Yellen and Chairman Benham will also announce civil regulatory enforcement actions and the Treasury Department and the, that the Treasury Department and the CFTC are taking against Binance. While criminal and civil enforcement actions are subject to different legal standards, this collective effort represents the whole of government approach that we are taking to combat corporate crime. Binance has agreed to plead guilty to willfully violating the Bank Secrecy Act knowingly failing to register as a money transmitting business and willfully violating the International Emergency Economic Powers Act. These laws ensure that our financial institutions are not available to designated terrorist organizations, drug traffickers, and sanctioned nation states that threaten public safety and our national security. The Justice Department is requiring Binance to pay $4.3 billion in penalties and forfeitures. This is one of the largest penalties we have ever obtained from a corporate defendant in a criminal matter. The Justice Department is also imposing a monitorship as well as reporting requirements on Binance as part of today's resolution. Moving forward, Binance must file the suspicious activity reports that were required by law. The company is required to review past transactions and report suspicious activity to federal authorities. This will advance our criminal investigations into malicious cyber activity and terrorism fundraising, including the use of cryptocurrency exchanges to support groups such as Hamas. While this historic plea is an important measure of accountability, we know that corporations only act through the individuals who run them. That is why we have also filed a felony charge against and secured a guilty plea from Chang Peng Zhao for willfully violating the Bank Secrecy Act. As C CEO of Binance, Zhao willfully violated federal law that requires financial institutions to guard against money laundering and terrorist financing. Zhao, who resides, resides outside of the United States, entered his plea in person 
in the United States District Court for the Western District of Washington earlier today. In August 2017, Zao founded Binance as a platform, platform where users could trade in cryptocurrency. But from the very beginning, Zao and other Binance executives engaged in a deliberate and calculated effort to profit from the U.S. market without implementing the controls that are required by U.S. law. Zao and Binance attracted and built a substantial U.S. customer base. Almost two years after Binance's founding, Zao told senior management that the U.S. market represented 20 to 30 percent of the company's potential revenue. Serving these U.S. customers meant that Binance was a U.S. financial institution. U.S. financial institutions must comply with U.S. law. Zhao and other senior management at Binance understood this. They understood that the company was required by U.S. law to register with the Treasury Department as a money services business. And they understood that they were required by U.S. law to implement an effective anti-money laundering program. They failed to do either. Instead, they concluded that complying with U.S. law would stifle their efforts to grow Binance's profits, market share, and trading volume. So, rather than comply, Binance facilitated billions of dollars of unregulated cryptocurrency transactions. It willfully enabled hundreds of millions of dollars in transactions between American users and users subject to U.S. sanctions. And its platform accommodated criminals across the world who used Binance to move their stolen funds and other criminal proceeds. Binance prioritized its profits over the safety of the American people. In part because of the crimes it committed, Binance became the largest cryptocurrency exchange in the world. Now, Binance is paying one of the largest corporate penalties in U.S. history. Binance employees knew and discussed that the company was serving thousands of users in sanctioned countries. And they knew that facilitating transactions between U.S. users and users in sanctioned countries would be in violation of U.S. law. But they did it anyway. Binance enabled nearly $900 million in transactions between U.S. and Iranian users. And it facilitated millions of dollars in transactions between U.S. users and users in Syria and in the Russian-occupied Ukrainian regions of Crimea, Donetsk, and Luhansk. Binance's own compliance personnel also knew that the company's anti-money laundering procedures were inadequate and would attract criminals to the platform. In a February 2019 chat, one compliance employee wrote that they needed a banner that said, quote, is washing drug money too hard these days? Come to Binance. We got cake for you. By failing to comply with U.S. law, Binance made it easy for criminals to move their stolen funds and illicit proceeds on its exchanges. For example, between August 2017 and April 2022, they were, there were direct transfers of approximately $106 million in Bitcoin to Binance.com wallets from Hydra. Hydra was a popular Russian darknet marketplace, frequently utilized by criminals, that facilitated the sale of illegal goods and services. Binance only stopped processing Hydra transactions in April of 2022, when the Justice Department and our criminal law enforcement partners seized control of the Hydra marketplace and shut it down. From February 2018 to May 2019, Binance price processed more than $275 million in deposits and $273 million in withdrawals from Best Mixer. Best Mixer was one of the largest cryptocurrency anonymizing services in the world before it was shut down for money laundering. Binance also did more than just fail to comply with federal law. It pretended to comply. In June 2016, 2019, Binance publicly announced that it would block U.S. users from Binance.com and launch a separate U.S. exchange. That exchange, Binance.us, would register with the Treasury Department and serve the U.S. market. 
Binance blocked some U.S. users on Binance.com and redirected them to the U.S. exchange. At the same time, however, Binance continued to allow some of its most important high-volume U.S. users to remain on the unregistered Binance.com exchange. At the direction of Zhao and other senior leaders at Binance, employees encouraged their high-volume U.S. users to conceal their U.S. connections, including by creating new accounts that obscured their locations. As Zhao himself said in a September 2019 chat, quote, if we block U.S. users from day one, Binance will not be as big as we are today. We would also not have had any U.S. revenue we had for the last two years. He then added, quote, better to ask for forgiveness than permission, close quote. Over a year after Binance publicly announced that it was blocking U.S. users, an internal monthly company report attributed 16 percent of its total registered user base to the United States. That was more than any other country on the unregulated Binance.com platform. In the next monthly report, Binance removed the United States label and recategorized U.S. users with the label UNKWN, short for unknown. In October 2020, users labeled as UNKWN represented approximately 17 percent of Binance's registered user base. Binance and Zhao profited significantly from their violations of federal law. That they are facing accountability for their crimes is due to the extraordinary hard work of the extraordinary public servants at the Department of Justice. I want to thank the Criminal Division's Money Laundering and Asset Recovery Section, the National Security Division's Counterintelligence and Export Control Section, and the United States Attorney's Office for the Western District of Washington for their excellent work. I also want to thank Secretary Yellen and her team at the Treasury Department, including IRS Criminal Investigation, as well as CFTC Chairman Benham and his team for their extraordinary partnership in this matter. In just the past month, the Justice Department has successfully prosecuted the CEOs of two of the world's largest cryptocurrency exchanges in two separate criminal cases. The message here should be clear. Using new technology to break the law does not make you a disruptor. It makes you a criminal. This Justice Department has no tolerance for crimes that threaten our economic institutions and undermine public trust in the fairness of those institutions. And we will hold accountable the individuals who commit and profit from them. I'm now pleased to turn the podium over to Secretary Yellen. Good afternoon. I'm very glad to join Attorney General Garland, Deputy Attorney General Monaco, and CFTC Chairman Benham on such an important occasion. We're here today to announce the Treasury Department's historic action, the largest enforcement action in Treasury's history against Binance, the world's largest virtual currency exchange for its consistent and egregious violations of U.S. anti-money laundering and sanctions law. Protecting the U.S. financial system, and through that, the global financial system, is core to the Treasury Department's mission. And ever since Binance launched its convertible virtual currency platform, it has knowingly evaded the U.S. laws designed to protect these systems. Over more than three years, FinCEN, OFAC, and IRS criminal investigation thoroughly investigated key aspects of Binance's activities. Our work revealed that Binance claimed to have exited the U.S. market years ago, but actually did not, retaining U.S. users and other significant ties with the United States. It also had critical gaps in its anti-money laundering program and practices, from a lack of risk-based procedures for various offerings 
to instructing staff to withhold information from law enforcement. It deliberately undermined its own sanctions monitoring controls, and it failed to report suspicious transactions. This meant Binance was allowing illicit acts, actors to transact freely, supporting activities from child sexual abuse to illegal narcotics to terrorism across more than 100,000 transactions. That includes transactions associated with terrorist groups like Hamas's al qassam brigades, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, al-Qaeda, and ISIS. Binance processed these transactions, but it never filed a single suspicious activity report, and it also allowed over one and a half million virtual currency trades that violated U.S. sanctions. So, we have taken— The Treasury Secretary of the United States, Janet Yellen, speaking right now at a press conference flanked by the Attorney General of the United States, Merrick Garland, his deputy, Lisa Monaco, and Ross Benham, who is the chair of the CFTC. A landmark settlement here involving Zhengbing Zhao. Of course, he was the founder and CEO at Binance, the cryptocurrency uh, platform. Mr. Zhao has agreed to pay $50 million in fines for his role in what Merrick Garland said was actually one of the more egregious examples that he saw of a finance company skirting U.S. laws. Binance itself will pay an aggregate $4.3 billion in fines in total. That includes $1.8 billion in fines and the forfeiture of $2.8 billion in other assets, according uh, to the filing and what Merrick Garland said. Shanali Basic still with us right now, our Wall Street Beat reporter. And Shanali, I thought this uh, really kind of summed it up here. Merrick Garland saying, using new technology to break the law does not make you a disruptor. It makes you a criminal. Speaking, of course, about a man who I think most people would argue is probably, or at least had been, the most influential person in crypto. And listen, just look at this, what's happening over here at this press conference. You have Janet Yellen, the tre tre Treasury Secretary, speaking to the crimes here. Listen, not only was this the biggest fine for the Department of Justice ever levied across yeah. a corporate entity, but yeah. also the biggest fine for the Treasury Department. Yeah. So seriously, a coordinated effort here. Yeah. And I just want to point out one other thing, too, that I think we kind of missed in all this. I mean, CZ is still facing potentially jail time. Uh, it says that the government is actually seeking an 18-month prison sentence, which would be the maximum suggested under federal guidelines. So kind of square the circle, because CZ himself just recently put out a statement, I believe it was on X, if, if I remember correctly, kind of saying that he's still going to be around. He's still going to be able to consult with the company. From jail, potentially. You know, how he, to your point you were making earlier, he had also um, maintained his stake in Binance. This is very important because it is the largest crypto exchange in the world. We don't know uh, what his future looks like yet. He could be facing jail time, as we've discussed. Listen, I think it's also worth uh, laying out some of the charges he faced. Yeah. What is he being accused of? Uh, the transactions made over Binance that aided and uh, the, the really serious crimes here child sexual abuse, illegal narcotics. Um, hundreds of thousands of transactions aiding such crimes around the world. 1.1 million transactions involving customers in Iran alone. Uh, 1.5 million virtual currency yeah. trades that violated sanctions globally. Well, what did you make of that, too? Because, I mean, he comes out, he references ISIS and Hamas and all these terrorist organizations. He also references uh, what looked like hundreds of thousands, if not millions of transactions involving Iran, which, of course, is under sanctions here in the U.S. Yeah, and this is the first time we've seen the extent to which Binance operated outside of the rules of not only the Un United States, but also a lot of large global economies, especially when it comes to sanctions laws. And so, you know, he, the crypto uh, being virtual, crypto being kind of boundless here, is really facing a, a you know, yeah. moment in terms of U.S. officials being able to say, we can clamp down on it anyways. All right. And we should point out, uh, Richard Tang, uh, Binance has put out a statement saying, Richard Tang, uh, Shanali will uh, now uh, be running uh, Binance in the interim. All right. Uh, Scarlett? 
Yeah, Bloomberg's Charlie Bassick, thank you and uh, for keeping us up to date on that story. And of course, we're also keeping an eye on what's going on in the markets here. The S&P 500, uh, the Nasdaq continue to falter for the first time in six days. The Fed minutes showed policymakers are pretty determined to proceed carefully on further rate hikes. Let's bring in now Amy Kong. She's partner and wealth advisor over at Corient. Amy, it's good to speak with you. And I know that we were just talking about what's going on with Binance and the crackdown on these crypto exchanges. I don't want you to comment on that specifically, but this idea that there is this crackdown, that the, the speculation that was so present in certain asset classes is being tamped down. To what extent does that filter, that sentiment, filter into the stock market at all? Yeah, hi, thanks for having me. Uh, it's a great question. Um, just judging by how the market's reacting, uh, it's really been a non-reaction to some of this breaking news. Um, I think in general, you know, we are watching how regulation does seep into the markets. And one of the areas that that could potentially play a role is this AI trend that we've been all talking about, where we're trying to see what companies can monetize off this trend and also how regulation can become more structured in this new area. So when you talk to your clients about all of that, beyond piling into the Magnificent Seven, beyond piling into the likes of NVIDIA, Microsoft, what are the other ways in, there in which they're expressing that? Sure, absolutely. So you've got Microsoft, you've got NVIDIA being very clear players in the AI space. We tend to play this trend in a multitude of different ways, and there are many different avenues to take this. One is, you know, thinking about cloud computing and software there. You do have the Microsofts and Amazons of the world. Strategic consulting is another area that we've been playing uh, some role here, and hopefully those types of companies will benefit from AI. Um, you also have companies that are trying to benefit from just offering features and services to the end user. Uh, Adobe being one example there. And so there's just multiple ways of playing it. But really the main takeaway for us is we're trying to cut through the noise. You can easily say AI in any press conference, but how do you monetize off that? How do you commercialize off that is really key for us going forward. How do you invest in that, Amy? I mean, beyond just the obvious, the Microsofts and NVIDIAs, where is the investment potential? Sure. Yeah, like I said, as I've mentioned, you know, you're trying to find areas that can benefit from the app developers, for example. Uh, I think Microsoft, to your point uh, earlier, as well as Amazon in the cloud computing space, could be one area of playing that. I just mentioned strategic consulting. Uh, we own companies like Accenture, which we believe could benefit as companies are throwing um, IT dollars towards this venue uh, and just trying to think about, well, how do you even start? Uh, and then, as I mentioned, Adobe being one of the key players that are trying to monetize off the end user. Again, there's just a multiple of different ways of playing AI across the entire spectrum. But really for us, the key is trying to find companies that have a sustainable way of monetizing off of these uh, trends. That, that to us is what's going to be um, the key winners throughout this mega trend over the next coming quarters. All right, Amy, going to have to leave it there. Amy, uh, have a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday. We'll catch up with you on the other side, I'm sure. Amy Kong, partner and wealth advisor over at Corian, help us count down to these closing bells. Scarlett, just about three minutes away. Yeah, and of course, as we look at what's been going on, I had to check on what uh, Bitcoin is doing. And I know it's not correlated necessarily with the headlines coming out about yeah. finance and everything, but still holding near that $37,000, yeah. $38,000 level. It was interesting that there was some price movement uh, on the heels of the redhead that we sent out about Binance's CZ yeah. uh, getting arrested. And we should point out that Binance's main coin uh, is down 4%, at least based on Bloomberg pricing. How Obviously, is those that, prices. Uh, well, it's pretty liquid. I mean, it's the third most liquid coin out there right now. Uh, after after Ethereum. So there is a definitely a material impact here. And I guess the question is, if you are going to be buying or using the platform, I should say, the yeah. question is, do you use it knowing the CZ is not there or do you have confidence in the new leadership going forward? Stick with us. We're going to get back to that story. We're going to set you up for NVIDIA earnings. A lot to go through right here on Bloomberg as we take you to the bell and beyond. Beyond the bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now, we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic alongside Scarlett Fu. We're counting you down to the closing bell. and here to help take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast with our friends Carol Masser and Tim Stenovic. Welcome to our audiences in full across our Bloomberg platforms here on this Tuesday afternoon. Carol Stocks on the back foot. Yeah, they absolutely are. I'm thinking about those Fed minutes, a unified front in terms of a cautious way forward. Maybe nothing new, but it's just a reminder that nothing's uh, a given. And I have to say, in a week that I thought was going to be kind of
of quiet and mellow between what's going on at OpenAI, between what we just all covered, you guys as well, we did too, at the Department of Justice and Treasury. In terms of the crypto world, it's a reminder that there is still a lot going on, and some of these things can ultimately rock, rock kind of the world and also investors. And uh, maybe investors to taking a breather today, waiting for the big earnings report that we're getting in just a few minutes. Is it going to be another blowout quarter from NVIDIA? The bar is certainly high, Scarlett, but I think what in, you know that's going to certainly set the tone, whatever NVIDIA says for tomorrow's trade. Yeah, but maybe the easy gains have been made, right? Uh, five of the seven magnificent seven names are down, including NVIDIA, and everyone's expecting a blowout quarter. It's just a matter of how much they blow out by. Yeah, um, all that uh, going on here. And before we get too deep in NVIDIA, because obviously this is going to dominate the conversation uh, over the next hour or so, I just want to go back uh, to the story we were talking about on Bloomberg Television a while ago, and that, of course, was the announcement uh, of the um, settlement deal mm -hmm. uh, with the CZ over at Binance here. Now, Binance putting out a statement, the new CEO basically saying that uh, Binance remains as stronger than ever. That press conference still going on, but it raises a big question here. You basically had the two biggest players in the crypto industry effectively now removed from their positions in one way or another here. And it really makes you wonder kind of uh, what the future of this uh, industry is going to be. You know, to that point, Romain, that's a, a, something I kept saying over and over again here in the studio when I was hearing Secretary Yellen, uh, is that all the argument uh, about crypto being legitimate and being used for legitimate purposes, these two things really feed into the worst arguments and the worst criticisms about crypto. Yeah, particularly in light of CZ's comments dunking on SBF when he was on the ropes uh, yeah. about a year ago here. But once again, the new CEO saying that uh, they are collaborating with regulators and he says that they are reassuring uh, users of Binance here that their funds are safe and sound. Let's go through the markets here, uh, the close. You can see right across the screen, volume lower here in a holiday shortened week, two tenths of a percent drop on the S&P, six tenths of a percent on the NASDAQ and the Russell, the, the underperformer here down more than a percent on the day. All right, quick check on the S&P 500. Kind of an even split, guys. Uh, 228 names to the upside here on this Tuesday. 273 to the downside. Scarlet, two unchanged. And looking at the industry groups and how they fared, you have autos, healthcare equipment, and uh, telecom services leading the on the upside, each gaining at least eight tenths of one percent. But the downside is where I find uh, it's a lot more interesting. You've got chip companies, all 21 names down, including Nvidia. Uh, also retail led lower by Lowe's. And by the way, this group has outperformed the broader market this year, so down 1.2 percent on the day. And banks also losing ground by three quarters of one percent. All right, as we await for Nvidia earnings, uh, let me get to the top gainer in the S&P 500, folks. It was Agilent Technologies, just finishing off yeah, its best levels. Time you said that. <laughs> I don't even know. Exactly. Uh, up about 8.7%. Funny. Uh, Life Sciences Company, we know it well. We don't talk about it a lot, but it did come out. Profit and sales for the fourth quarter did top expectations that were set by the street. Analysts also see the firm's 2024 guidance as a sign of demand uh, stabilizing. So some optimism there, and that's where investors uh, were buying into. Number two. You know, I was I, just what? real quickly, because yeah. we were joking about this earlier, and I was looking. I mean, you had to go back to March of 2020, the last time it, it had a move like this. And if you exclude March of 2020 as an outlier, you have to go back all the way to 2004 to see a move like this. Yeah, investors yeah. digging deep, yeah. right, in yeah. this in this market says something. Mm -hmm. Tesla, however, the number two gainer on the Nasdaq 100, up about 2.4 percent here. Uh, looking for news, kind of a weird bag, or if you will, or mix of news. But India said to be closer to an agreement with Tesla to import X EVs and also set up a factory within two years. This is according to folks in the know who are familiar with what the Indian government is thinking about this. This stock, though up 95% year to date. And retailers were still getting earnings. We're going to get a few after the close. Uh, Burlington Stores, this one was an outperformer in today's session, up 20% in the trade. Uh, $10 billion dollar retail. Explain that to me. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know. I really don't. It did post a third quarter profit and same store sales beat. Analysts said the results were better than feared. I love that. Better than we thought you we thought you were going to do really badly. Uh, it could bring some relief for shares. Well, it did certainly in today's session. All right. You got the gainers, Carol. Go. I got the decliners. Let's take a look at the worst performer uh, in the S&P 500 on a points basis. Worth taking a look at Microsoft. That's the one that takes it down 1.16%. Remember, the company did reach a new all-time high yesterday. Also worth taking a look at Microsoft in the wake of everything that's happening with regard to the drama at OpenAI. Sam Altman, will he or won't he go back to OpenAI? Our own Bloomberg News team uh, reporting that uh, just in the last couple of hours that Sam Altman and the members of the OpenAI board and the interim company's CEO have opened a negotiation 
allegations aimed at a possible reinstatement back at OpenAI. Uh, also, we're taking a look at shares of Ford falling on the why, day today. Why? Why, Tim? Why go I, back to Yeah, why try AI? to put this back together? Uh, <laughs> I, I don't you know understand. what's funny? Carol and I were talking about this earlier. If you're like, went to sleep on Friday and we're still asleep now and perhaps woke up tomorrow <laughs> and Sam Altman was still, you, you know. You missed nothing. You missed nothing. I said, you know, a lot of spilled ink and a lot of uh, sleepless nights for our colleagues at Bloomberg News, but. And a lot of ulcers in Silicon Valley. Yeah, that is true. That is true. It's been, it's been sort of a wild few days. But look, you know, we don't know what's going to happen still. So. So we'll, but we will bring you the latest when we do know. Uh, Ford shares down 1.45%. Earlier today, we got the news that Ford is reducing capacity and hiring plans at a battery plant that it's building in Michigan because of that weaker demand that it sees for EVs. This is the Marshall factory. It was on pause for a couple months. It's only going to produce enough batteries to power about 230,000 EVs a year. That's down from 400,000 EVs per year. Ford has pulled back on its EV strategy. Romaine includes delaying $12 billion in spending on battery-powered models. Remember back to the most recent report, uh, Ford abandoned plans to build 2 million EVs annually by the end of 2026, Doesn't won't say when it expects to reach that milestone, and sales of its F-150 Lightning down 46% yeah, in that's, the third quarter. That's so surprising. I thought that was going to be a hit. Yeah, we're speaking yeah. to the CEO of uh, Blink uh, Charging a little later in the program, and we're going to ask him what's going on with uh, EVs, because they were all the rage, uh, you know, People 18 months ago. People who wanted one have one, and for everyone else, it's yeah. pretty expensive, and in, yeah. if you don't have a garage, where are you going to charge it? Yeah. Uh, let's uh, actually nothing really going on uh, in the yield space today here. Lower pretty much across the board, only by about one to two basis points, depending on where you go. But this is really an earnings day. We are awaiting earnings out of NVIDIA, but earnings for Nordstrom are crossing the wire right now. Let's see if we can go there here because the shares are lower here and after hours trading, despite the fact that adjusted EPS in the most recent quarter beat by big 25 cents a share. The street was looking for 12 cents a share. Revenue in the quarter, though, looked like a miss. So 3.32 billion in the most recent quarter. The street was looking for 3.42 billion. So it missed on revenue, but had a big beat uh, on EPS here. I'm not re really seeing. Oh, here's your guidance going forward here. And this is why the shares are down. Mm -hmm. Full year revenue expected to be down four to six percent a negative sign in front of both of those numbers they're given a range of four to six percent drop in full year revenue and saying that full year adjusted eps also could potentially come in below street estimates it's range that it's giving guys 190 to 210 a share I got to say, in the press release, the chief executive officer, and given continued uncertainty and softening consumer spend, Scarlett, we're remaining agile and focused on serving our customers. But they talked about a lot, uh, or talked lo a lot about theft mm -hmm. uh, back in August. They also talked about credit card delinquencies were rising gradually. So we'll continue to look this, through this press release to see if that continues to be of, uh, of this concern. This goes back to that idea that we're out wondering why is Burlington up and uh, Nordstrom is down here yeah. Yeah. because people are trading down from the likes of Nordstrom to the discount retailers. The Price but that's a big trick. Uh, forgive me, but those are two <laughs> but, very, very different retailers. No, no you would say it. That's what we're all thinking. I mean, it does. We're, we're, we're East Coast elites, or we're coastal elites, whatever they are. It, it does. Very it different. also plays into the story that we published on Bloomberg News, the exclusive data that we got from Bloomberg Second Measure earlier today. Romain, I know you were talking about yeah, it earlier yeah. on the program that even folks who earn more than hundred thousand dollars a year, uh, mm -hmm. hundred thousand dollars a year and above, are pulling back on that spending, and kind of feeds into the earnings that we got earlier this morning about those big purchases being put off and about the. Yeah consumer, uh, even at the high end, but, weakening but a little. Let me just jump in here because another specialty retailer did report, and I don't know if you can find Urban Outfitters' stuff uh, at a Burlington or any of those off-price retailers, but third quarter adjusted EPS did beat analyst estimates, 88 cents versus the consensus estimate of 82 cents. Uh, and then the retail segment sales rose 5.6%. This is comparable sales. Uh, analysts were looking for a five and a quarter percent increase. Uh, comparable sales, let's see, for the... Out, let me see. Urban Outfitters. I guess that's just the brand itself. The comparable sales dropped 14.2% uh, when analysts were looking for 13.7%. Urban Outfitters claims no. that it's a lifestyle products company rather than mm. just a but apparel gets, company. But it gets us to the thing. I mean, you mentioned that 14% number. I assume that's just for Urban Outfitters, yes, the brand. Because we talk about uh, anthropology yep. and free people, which have done well. Uh, do they own Madewell, or is that something else? Or no, that's J. Crew. Right. That's J. Crew. But yeah. anyway, but it gets to this point as to whether that pillar, because remember you think about Gap and how that sort of didn't work. Remember, it worked for a while, having mm -hmm. Old Navy, having Gap, and, and uh, Banana whatever Republic. else, Banana Republic. But you wonder where some of these other companies, whether that structure is still going to work for them. No, it's a really good point. All right, yeah. folks, we are obviously waiting for NVIDIA. It hasn't crossed yet, but I know you guys are going to break it down as soon as it does, and we will as well. Um,
But that's a wrap. Who's going to do it better? <laughs> we will. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> All right. That's a wrap. Our cross. Love you. Love you. That's a wrap. Our cross platform coverage, radio, TV, YouTube, and of course, Bloomberg Originals. We're waiting for NVIDIA. We'll see you tomorrow, guys. All right, stick with us, keeping an eye on earnings, big movers, Urban Outfitters, Nordstrom, and Autodesk, all out with their reports. We're waiting, though, on the big one, NVIDIA, best performer in the, in the equity markets this year. They're going to have to show and prove. We're going to have full coverage coming up after the break. This is Bloomberg. Another low volume day in U.S. equity markets, which is pretty typical of any Thanksgiving holiday week here in the U.S. You can take a look at some of the individual movers and you weren't getting a lot of help from those big cap tech names. Microsoft down a percent on the day. NVIDIA, which we're waiting on results, down a percent as well. And Nordstrom, which just came out with its results, was down 2 percent in the cash session. And now it looks like it might be losing some steam here in after hours trading. We're going to get results out of Deer tomorrow morning, and that is effectively going to kind of cap off the earnings season. A few stragglers going to come maybe a couple weeks after that like Salesforce but what you see right now is what you've got and for the most part we avoided that profit recession this was actually a relatively <coughs> decent quarter when it comes to profitability not necessarily on the revenue growth side but margins are holding up across the board of course the moves in yields the moves in crude and more importantly the moves that we've been seeing in the commodity space are really going to be a big dictate of what we see going forward in this market a market that at least seems to have bought into the idea right now that the Fed is done Scarlett all right, you mentioned Nordstrom being down in the regular trading hours. Uh, Nordstrom extending its decline in after hours trading after it uh, posted its results. Third quarter net sales missing analyst estimates, $3.2 billion. Analysts were looking for $3.36 billion. And as for its full year outlook, it did narrow that outlook uh, both on the low end and on the high end. It now sees uh, earnings of $1.90 to $2.10. So we want to bring in Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Equity Research Analyst Mary Ross Gilbert for more context here. Mary, you had mentioned that these third quarter net sales numbers look a little bit light, which is disappointing in light of the fact that Nordstrom held its anniversary sale during the period that ended. Uh, usually that provides a pretty big boost to its results. Yes, well, actually, so they, they had one week that shifted into this quarter from the second quarter, and that was a 200 basis points lift. So when you look at their comp sales down 6.8% versus the estimate from analysts looking for a down 3.5%, that was worse than expected. Mm -hmm. And it looks like most of that really came on the full line side of the business being the Nordstrom full line stores, whereas the rack stores were, were you know, I think they were down 1.8 uh, percent, something like that. But if you adjusted for last year's shipment of online orders from stores, which negatively impacted about the business by about 100 basis points, rack sales were OK. But I think they are sort of short when you compare the overall off price business being, you know, we had strong numbers coming out of Burlington this morning. And of course, we already had Ross and TJX last week with good numbers. So it seems like on off price, they're a little behind, but they did indicate they didn't expect to turn positive until the fourth quarter. And we'll certainly yeah. learn more conference call. Absolutely. So I, I want to ask you about Rack because ever since they launched it, it's been doing pretty well. And to what extent is that cannibalizing the main Nordstrom business? Yeah, so what they've always said is that's been their number one customer acquisition tool and that that draws business into the full line stores. So they're they're sort of saying, hey, it's really not cannibalistic. But the fact that they do have some a strong showing of the brands that you typically find in Nordstrom. Exactly. And the fact that there's a lot of excess inventory generally out there and off price, the consumer is choosing value and that's what you're seeing. And then you're also seeing a normalization in the designer business. So we're going to hear more about that on the call. But what we've been seeing all year is that the designer business has really slowed down more to normalize levels and maybe even off a little more as consumers are being a little more thoughtful in making a purchase and, and just not purchasing the volume that they had been. 
Yeah, this raises a lot of questions, Mary, about kind of what they can do next here. And particularly, I'm talking about the leadership and what uh, Eric Nordstrom has tried to pivot this company. When you look at the sales declines in both of the main units, when you look at the stagnation that you have in terms of their uh, online sales, which are still at the same percentage uh, share that they have been for the last couple of quarters here, uh, this almost seems like a company now that's almost in stasis. What gets it out of that? No, Romaine, that is a really good question. And one of the things that they did announce is they have a new chief merchant, you know, with uh, one of the Nordstrom brothers. And that's what we're looking to hear more about, yeah. what changes are going to happen. And, and we certainly see that they need to up their game, both in the way they're executing in the store, but also online. If you go online and you look at their overall Black Friday, the presentation I think could be a lot better, especially when you look at other luxury companies such as, let's say, Saks Fifth Avenue, Neiman Marcus, or even Bloomingdale's and how they are out there, you know, how they're going to market to reach the consumer. So I think there's opportunity there. The question is, you know, how are they going to execute on that? And that's what we're looking to hear. Um, this gets to the uh, broader question, Mary, and I, I think Scarlett was kind of touching on it, too. I thought the whole idea of Rack and the, the, the traditional Nordstrom uh, stores, they were supposed to be comp to kind of complement each other. And we saw that, I felt like, I don't know, it was a few years ago before the pandemic, where Nordstrom itself would have issues, but Nordstrom Rack would do well, and that would kind of be the pillar that keeps it up. And, there, and we were kind of talking about this before the break, that there are a lot of companies, retail companies, that built up similar structures, whether it was what Gap did, uh, whether what you're seeing with Urban Outfitters, these sort of multi-brands, where if one does uh, bad, the other does well. Is that whole structure, is that just broken? It kind of raises an issue. I don't think it's broken, but I think what they're finding, you know, Macy's has done the same thing, Romaine, with it, the backstage concept that Macy's has. And, of course, we saw stronger performance out of backstage than we saw out of the regular Macy's well, can, can I? But can I stop you there for one second? I, ask people on the street, do people understand what backstage is? And, and, I, and I say that because there is a branding exercise there that I felt works against Nordstrom by calling their other store, their off-price store, Nordstrom Rack. I agree. I think it should just be the rack, you know, rather than yeah. Nordstrom rack. But I think the reason why they keep the name in there is they feel like they're highly differentiated because mm -hmm. they're carrying their, you know, they're supposed to be carrying the same brands that, that they offer at the Nordstrom business. But right now, especially coming off 2022, we are really seeing good, strong national brands across all of off price. Yeah. And so it's pretty competitive out there. Yeah, it works against them right now. So inventory management has been critical for these department store chains. And we've heard from Macy's, we've heard from uh, all these other companies and, and how they proceed with that. If Nordstrom, a company like Nordstrom, gets the inventory management right for the full line brand, for the full line store, doesn't that mean that Nordstrom Rack will suffer as a result because there's less uh, overflow going into Nordstrom Rack? No, not necessarily. I mean, it raises a question, Scarlett, but... The thing is, right now, across the industry, and we heard this with all the off-price retailers, there, there is plenty of excess branded, national branded merchandise out there. They're not seeing any slowdown whatsoever in that. And so I think the same will also be true for Nordstrom Rack, even with Nordstrom getting the full line inventories, you know, in check. Because remember, this is primarily national branded merchandise, mm -hmm. and they do carry a fair amount of private label within the rack stores too. And the problem that they had previously that hurt the rack sales had been, um, let's say, poor execution on the private brand, but they're seeing an improvement this year mm -hmm. and that, that could sort of help. All right, uh, Mary, great to catch up with you. Mary Ross Gilbert over at Bloomberg Intelligence, a breakdown of Nordstrom's earnings. We should point out here, the revenue not looking great, at least on a growth basis, but they did hit it out of the park on EPS and apparently that's because they're offering fewer uh, discounts. Uh, we want to pivot to the tech space as we await uh, results out of NVIDIA, already getting results out of HP Inc., HPQ, the ticker. Those shares down in after hours trading after the company said that its 4Q adjusted EPS pretty much came in line with estimates at 90 cents a share. Its revenue in that most recent quarter uh, also coming in pretty much on the nose, 13.82 billion. The street was looking for 13.8. And here's your forecast going forward. For the fiscal first quarter, which is the quarter that we're currently in, the company says EPS will come in at 
76 to 86 cents a share. The street on average was looking for 85 cents a share. So the low end of that range will be well below uh, what the street was looking for. But Scarlett, the company uh, is saying uh, that free cash flow uh, will hold relatively tight. I believe we're getting NVIDIA earnings uh, crossing the wire right now. Yep, that's right. NVIDIA, of course, the best performing stock of the S&P 500 this year, reporting earnings uh, per share adjusted EPS of $4.02, handily beating the average analyst estimate of $3.36. Revenue of $18.12 billion is much higher than the consensus estimate of $16.09 billion. Uh, and as well, adjusted gross margin for this quarter was 75%. Analysts were looking for somewhere in the neighborhood of 72 and a half percent. The powerhouse of NVIDIA is really the data center. Revenue in that segment was $14.5 billion, $14.51 billion. Analysts were looking for just under $13 billion, $12.82 billion. And by the way, that is a huge, huge increase, um, at least 240 percent from the same time a year ago. Uh, in terms of fourth quarter revenue remain, uh, NVIDIA is expected uh, $20 billion for the fourth quarter revenue, plus or minus 2 percent. Yeah, I, this is, I mean, interesting to see the share reaction. I was wondering if this was going to happen, right? It almost didn't matter how good these numbers yeah. were. When you have a stock that's, uh, what, more than tripled uh, on the year. 240% year uh, 240% on the year. Uh, and, you know, look, we were speaking with the analysts earlier who kind of said, look, the valuation isn't actually that out of whack. He actually said that on a forward basis, believe it or not, their PE level, their forward PE is actually below their historical average. I didn't have a chance to double check that. It's but, 45 times estimated. Well, he says that that's actually wrong and that we had this whole debate about but huh. it gets to this idea here of what you're valuing this at. And I don't know. I mean, what do they have to do in terms of growth, whether it's on the revenue side or profitability side, that gets them another 240% gain on the stock? Yeah, it's a really good question. Yeah. I mean, they've, give, they've put them, given themselves all these benchmarks. They've more than per, uh, surpassed them. Yeah. Um, investors want more certainty looking forward. But how can you give certainty for, say, 2020, end of 2024, early 2025? Is that possible at this point? And it's interesting. I mean, just looking through the release, and we haven't had a time to, to parse it there, but they're going through very specific examples of adoption uh, of their chips and their technology in the AI realm. Of course, they mentioned uh, Google. They mentioned Microsoft Azure. Mm -hmm. They mentioned Oracle and the cloud infrastructure here. Uh, so it's almost like the low-hanging fruit they've gotten. They've gone to those big gigantic enterprise customers and they've clearly got them on board yeah the question is now you have to go down a tier and it's not just a matter of demand it's also a matter of who can afford it and also whether they can meet the demand and if they can't meet the demand whether these customers go somewhere else or like uh, microsoft for instance start to develop their own in-house chips at some point that wouldn't necessarily be an NVIDIA killer, but at least reduces their reliance on NVIDIA. All right, let's get some insights uh, out of Dan Newman. Daniel Newman joining us. He's the CEO over at the Futurum Group. Uh, and I know uh, you haven't had a whole lot of time to uh, parse the results, Dan, but, but trust me, overall, they were good despite the market reaction here. And I guess the question is, what do you actually want out of this company? I mean, what can they tell you that I think would have, give you some material comfort here that the stock can go higher on the heels of a 240% run? Yeah, these are really good numbers. And, and overall, I think the tape was what most people expected. And in fact, the selling that came after is a byproduct of the fact that everyone expected this really significant beat. When Jensen Wong talks to the, to the street today and shares his thoughts, people want to hear about China. They want to understand that one of the largest markets in the world is in play and that the silicon that's being developed by NVIDIA will continue to be able to be sold into that important market. And of course, how the company is going to you know, split the concerns for geopolitical reasons. And then, of course, they want to understand what's going on with the homegrown silicon. I, you know, you, I heard you mention the Microsoft Azure announcements that came from Ignite last week. Mm -hmm. AWS has spent a decade building yep. homegrown silicon. And I think those lower cost, uh, high performing uh, yeah. options, as we see training and inference pivot, yeah, uh, could become a challenge. So people want to know how they're yeah. going to address that. Well, let's talk about another big uh, issue uh, in the room right now. We're getting a headline as we're speaking here, Dan, uh, that NVIDIA expects sales to China to decline significantly here in the fourth quarter, though the company does say that the decline will be offset by other regions. And this gets us to the idea here that there are uh, geopolitical issues that have nothing to do with uh, how they manage the company that are they're going to have to navigate. And right now, you're trying to sort of create or I guess sell to the second largest economy at a time when the U.S. government doesn't necessarily want you to. Yeah, this is the problem of every company in the high tech space. And if you're a chip maker, whether it's Intel or Qualcomm or NVIDIA or AMD, 
they're all up against this. You saw the complexities, what AMAT is going through and the probe. Companies are trying to figure out how to sell into this market. They're probably trying to do it honestly, but of course there's these gray areas. The rules are changing very quickly. And like I said, the market wants to know that this is in play, that China is in play for a company like NVIDIA. Having said that, the demand is so significant. And whether it's Azure or AWS, which are building their own, or it's, it's Google and it's TPS, all these companies are doing massive investments in NVIDIA infrastructure. Of course, I do think new competitors are a threat. I do believe AMD's new products, uh, you heard Lisa Sue last quarter, I talked to her, she said there's uh, almost 2 billion. And again, this sounds small, but there is real interest and real demand in competitive products. And of course, can they maintain these margins? This margin growth, is like something I've never mm -hmm. seen before tracking companies like NVIDIA. Yeah, third quarter adjusted gross margin, just a reminder here, 75%, analysts were looking for 72.5%. You mentioned AMD, and um, I believe it's got a 10% share, but it's a far second behind NVIDIA. So if demand is insatiable and NVIDIA is pretty much the only game in town with AMD kind of nipping at its heels, how much is it exercising its pricing power? Is, is it taking advantage of this by charging as much as it wants at this point? Look, there's rumors on the streets of H100s uh, seeing 1,000% margins. Of course, NVIDIA has systems. It made big investments in networking. NVLink, you're hearing instead of just selling chips, there's more system sales, which means it's more selling across the SKU. Um, is it packaging bundling versus just trying to win as much of the market because the OEMs and ODMs are selling through everything they can get their hands on? But that's enabled the company to raise prices. So the prices are up considerably. And I've been saying to the market for some time, uh, and I called NVIDIA reaching a trillion quite some time ago in market cap. And I, I still think there, there, there's room for them to run up. But I do think parts of the market are going to be looking for lower cost alternatives. That's why AWS, that's why uh, Microsoft uh, have been doing what they're doing. And that's why Intel, even coming late to the party and AMD, believe there is a market to be won. So AI is going to grow. And that's the really exciting thing about all this is they've had all this growth and development and it's really still early days. Yeah, absolutely. This is a this this might feel like it's coming out of left field, but how does Nvidia stand to benefit or suffer from the open AI drama be, beyond its ability to poach talent, as uh, all the different companies out there are trying to do right now? Well, I, I I think it's early to tell whether Nvidia would be impacted directly. Now, of course, the development of new large language models, all the companies playing in the space, Cohere, Anthropic, Hugging Face. Um, you know, you got companies like IBM that are all in this space. They all need more compute. So the partnership between OpenAI and Microsoft had to do with compute. That was good for NVIDIA. It would be good for the homegrown silicon, which is what in, uh, it, Microsoft was trying to do, was to lower some of the cost and potentially use more of their own processing power. I don't think the open AI thing is as big of an, of an influence on NVIDIA because whether the workloads move to a different LLM, they still need compute. Mm -hmm. Now the lower cost, more sustainable as you move from GPUs to ASICs, you know, mm -hmm. specific chips for specific applications, that's where I start to see NVIDIA being at risk because GPUs, they use a lot of power and they're very expensive. I am curious about some of the companies and the executives that you speak to, those that not are directly affiliated with NVIDIA, and kind of what they're saying about the spend, because we've had CEOs on this show and CFOs who've really kind of talked about this idea of just how expensive it is to go down this road, particularly if you don't already have some sort of a roadmap uh, to uh, a profitable use case already. Yeah, it's a very interesting um, moment for almost all enterprises, making a decision of, of how much to invest and where. I've done some research. We've looked at the intel across our intelligences, where are companies spending on AI? Meaning, do they want to basically consume it at the application layer, maybe in a CRM app, in their ERP or their human resources application, and they want, you know, say Salesforce and their genie to do their, their AI, or do they want to really build it from the ground up? And when you talk about building foundational models from the ground up, you're talking hundreds of millions of dollars to enter. So there's only a small number of companies that can do it. And that's why, to your earlier point, so many of these dollars are going to hyperscale cloud and some of these new AI data center companies like CoreWeave is because they're standing up infrastructure, then big ISVs are building tools and applications on top, and then enterprises of all sizes are consuming AI at the application level. And that's how I see it scaling. Small businesses will not be standing up foundational models. Mm. However, if IBM or 
AWS offers a bunch of foundational models for an industry that you can use on a pay per use. That's kind of the cloud of the future with AI layered on top of it. Dan, sit tight for one second because we're going to bring in Kunjan Sobani. He's uh, Bloomberg Intelligence's senior semiconductors analyst. And uh, Kunjan, I'm looking at the stock right now for NVIDIA. It has turned positive. It had fallen initially on this big beat, uh, yet another big beat by NVIDIA, but now has turned uh, into the green. What is the number one thing investors want to hear on the conference call that would allow the stock to actually build on its recent gains as opposed to pull back on yet another beat as it's been doing for the last earnings report? I think the key thing in the call that investors want to hear more about the clarity on the China. I mean, it's great that it's the China decline is going to be offset from demand from the rest of the world. And I think there is less concerns on the demand, at least for the second first half of 24. I think we want to hear more about what does this imply on sort of second half 24 and going forward, especially that because that time coincides with ramp from AMD's MI 300X. Yeah, yeah, so yet another quarter here from NVIDIA in which it beats the top line and the bottom line. I counted it. You go all the way back to the third quarter of 2012. That's 44 quarterly earnings reports, and NVIDIA has missed only three times. Uh, Kunjam Sobani and Daniel Newman of the Futurum Group. Kunjam, of course, of Bloomberg Intelligence. Thank you both so much uh, for joining us. Now, NVIDIA, of course, one of the companies at the center of U.S.-China chip tensions. For more context and to kind of broaden out our conversation here, let's bring in Sarah Shu. She's a clinical associate professor of supply chain management at the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. Uh, Sarah, you heard from uh, Kunjan and what he was saying about how the, the, the onus on NVIDIA here is to explain how it's going to navigate these uh, U.S. restrictions on sales to China. Is the goal for the U.S. government to just prevent these companies from making any sales to China? Well, I think it's really challenging. Um, NVIDIA has um, been trying repeatedly to try to create um, GPUs um, and other types of chips that would allow them to um, go around some of the tightest restrictions on um, advanced chips. Those were previously thwarted um, a couple of months ago. Um, now NVIDIA um, has come out with uh, some chips that are a little bit uh, lower in terms of processing level, and um, they're going to be selling them to uh, to China, the Chinese market, in the second quarter of uh, 2024. And you know, hopefully, that will go well. I think there's a pretty big demand um, for those types of chips in China. So in your research, when you look at um, how companies need to position themselves and how they need to manage through these kinds of uh, sudden flare-ups of geopolitical tensions, what is, the, what is the usual playbook and does that apply in this instance? Well, there's really not a, a usual playbook, playbook for this type of thing. Um, you know, we're going to have a presidential election in which we have um, most likely two candidates that are relatively hawkish on China. Um, and it looks like this uh, U.S.-China technology war is not set to end anytime soon. Um, and we also heard from um, Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo state that um, the U.S. is going to review the, um, the rules on technology export restrictions at least annually. And so um, the restrictions are most likely to become um, tighter every year. Um, I'd be really shocked if there was anything uh, to the contrary. Um, luckily, NVIDIA uh, invests um, more money, um, a larger percentage of its revenue um, in research and development to find ways that it can actually cater to the Chinese market. Um, we've also, you know, a lot of people have been talking about how there's significant demand um, coming for uh, NVIDIA's GPUs even outside of China. So yeah. um, it looks like it is you know, set to do well. I am curious. Uh, there was a story on the Bloomberg Terminal today about this idea of chip packaging, Sarah, this idea uh, that China has sort of found a way, at least around certain aspects of these restrictions, uh, where you kind of package all the components together here. So effectively, you can source uh, some of those components, I guess, from third parties. And there was a lot of speculation, particularly with the release of that Huawei phone a couple of months ago, as to whether uh, there were some relevant workarounds that they could have used. Yeah, I mean, um, there were a number of um, ways in which China could have uh, skirted some of the restrictions um, with regard to its Huawei phone, um, you know, potentially stocking up on certain components or um, using uh, the machinery um, in a way in which it wasn't supposed to be used um, or, um, you know, 
a number of many th of things. Yeah. But um, packaging might be another area in which the U.S. is set to make additional um, regulations. Interestingly, for NVIDIA, um, it has supply constraints, and one of its major supply constraints is the packaging aspect, that most of it is carried out by TSMC in Taiwan. So again, we're looking to Asia, the China-Taiwan area um, for supply constraints and bottlenecks. I think that could be a major issue going forward. And this gets back to the idea, though, Sarah, because when I was looking at, at the proposal, and, it, and it's kind of couched in this idea of spending $3 billion to basically onshore a lot of this stuff, similar to how they want to onshore uh, some of the manufacturing. But it gets to the question as to whether that's practical. I understand the political will to want to do this here. But when we talk about the expertise and, more importantly, the cost, here, do you think we will have a future where uh, the lion's share, the majority, if you will, of these chips are designed, manufactured, and packaged here in the United States? I mean, I think that it's really challenging to do that. Um, I don't know that we have um, most of the you know, expertise to do that type of manufacturing, even though we're able to construct the fabs here. Um, those take several years to set up and get online, um, you know, but there are also other issues with it, you know, gaining the expertise and really hitting the runway. Um, other companies like TSMC have had many years um, to get started on that. And um, despite that, um, there are also other materials that are sourced internationally. Um, the semiconductor in industry uses thousands of components. And so it's very, very global. So even if we did that, uh, you know, there's no indication that we would be entirely insulated um, from China uh, or the rest of Asia. All right. Uh, always great to talk to you. Sarah Shu there's clinical associate professor of supply chain management at the University of Tennessee at Knoxville as we continue our focus here on AI on chips and, of course, on the back of those NVIDIA earnings, which just crossed the wire a little while ago. Of course, there's a drama over at OpenAI, which we're still waiting to be resolved. Bloomberg was the first to report that Sam Altman and members of the OpenAI board are currently in talks to negotiate Altman's possible return. <laughs> This comes, yeah, I laugh too, Scarlett. This comes amid threats from open AI workers to walk out, to effectively leave the company. And let's face it, we've had several CEOs already taking to social media saying, yeah, come to Salesforce, come to Microsoft, come to Alphabet. Altman's ousting a Microsoft CEO telling Bloomberg about the governance changes that he would want to see to stick around. We definitely will want some governance changes. So, that, you, know, you know, surprises are bad. And uh, we just want to make sure that things are done in a way that will allow us to con continue to partner well. That's about it. Jenna Egger is joining us right now for a little bit more perspective on this uh, saga. She is the CEO of Nara Logistics and one of the pioneers uh, in the AI space. And I, I just uh, really I have to start with kind of the, 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 the sort of six million dollar question here. And maybe it's one you can't answer. But for a company, for an organization, I should say, with open AI that has effectively lost its founder. I know officially he's not completely out the door just yet here, but is this something that can really be put back together? I feel like at this stage, everyone is, is circling right now, trying to poach as many people as they can. What's left here to put back together? That's a great question. And I think that uh, one of the things that, that tells you, yes, there is a possibility, is how many of those employees signed the, um, the letter to bring Sam back. And so that tells you there is cohesion there. So it wasn't just a few or um, uh, that, that put that out. So I think you do have an opportunity there to keep that team mm -hmm. together. And I think you saw, um, you know, from Satya and, and Microsoft is behind that as well and is a, open to whatever resolution happened. Yeah. Um, he said the key word of governance. And uh, I think that that's what really broke down this time. Well, well, let's talk about that, too, because, I mean, we've had you on this program to talk a lot about the, the ethics behind AI, whether this is all going to kill us or whether it's going to be our salvation. And this appears to be a fundamental issue with his departure. The idea that when this company was started, it was specifically structured as a nonprofit with the mindset of instead of moving fast and break things, it was go slow and be careful. In 2019, they made a conscious decision by Sam Altman and the board, for that matter, to create this sort of dual structure, a capped profit structure, which is where all that money and those billions of dollars came pouring into. So why would there be a disconnect between Sam Altman sort of wanting to, I guess, move a little bit faster in that realm when the board explicitly endorsed this, this sort of split uh, system? 
I think maybe they didn't know so much about what that would mean, and they're, they were further apart than they realized, which happens with all of us at times. And it's even messier in a startup when you're moving so quickly and there's so much attention on you and so much money there. So you've got lots of pressure building up that causes something like this. And like I said, startups are hard. Now, there are boards that work like this. You look at Mozilla, for example, and mm. they've been operating in, in this kind of dual structure for quite a while and, and have executed very well. So maybe some folks that had some experience there, um, I think that governance piece is really, is really key. And if the board could get together and figure out the governance in this type of particular situation, I think that's where they um, gain some benefit. Thank you for pointing out. I mean, we, we had heard that this is not an unusual structure. It has been used before, and uh, there are instances where it does work. Nevertheless, you look at what's happening now. It's moved quickly. Things have gotten out of the board's control, and it's a train wreck that you can't turn away from. What is the lesson here for founders, folks who have started up their own companies and have a board structure in place but are wondering, wait, have, a, have we outgrown this board structure? Yeah, I think so. I think, um, you know, one of the great things about founders is they're always driving for the next. And I think they don't always realize how important a board is. And, and boards are really important. And it's not just for the governance part, but it's for perspective. And so I would say, you know, getting people with experience there that also understand your technology. And that's what's really hard is you also have boards that don't understand the technology and then they are not necessarily giving the best guidance for you at that time. And so I don't think the board turnover, I, I've seen some analysis that say, oh, this board has been chaotic and turning over. I actually think that was probably a, a good thing to happen, but maybe they didn't continue to turn over and learn and really think about how should this be structured and learn from folks that have done it before. By the same token, what is a lesson for investors, for a Microsoft, for mm -hmm. anyone else who's been pumping money into open AI. Yeah, I think, I, I think uh, you know, Sancta said it. His one word was governance. And, and uh, I do think that there's a lot of trust when something like that happens and they're excited about the technology, but you have to look at the business structure behind and, and who is there and what can they bring in. Um, and I think Microsoft knows this, but probably said, you know, well, that's more for us as a large company needing that kind of board governance. I actually think it's really important in startups. Mm. Um, and I've, I've been in seven startups, none of them have shut down. So, uh, you know, it, it's hard, it's a lot of work and there's a lot more expectations on, I'm on a public company board. There's a lot of expectations on, a lot of different expectations on private company boards for what you need to do, especially in these early stages as you're still trying to figure things out. All right, Jenna, always great to get your perspective. Jenna Eggers there, she's CEO over at Neurologix, uh, helping us walk through uh, still the unfolding saga surrounding Sam Altman and OpenAI. In just a minute, we're going to go back to the unfolding saga in the crypto space here with the settlement agreement with Binance and CZ. We're going to hear in just a bit from the Coinbase CEO, Brian Armstrong. This is Bloomberg. Justice Department is requiring Binance to pay $4.3 billion in penalties and forfeitures. This is one of the largest penalties we have ever obtained from a corporate defendant in a criminal matter. That was U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland speaking at a news conference earlier. He was discussing Binance and its CEO, CZ, uh, who pleaded today guilty to criminal charges for anti-money laundering and U.S. sanctions violations. The company itself agreed to pay more than $4 billion in penalties. 
Joining us now is Shanali Basak with a conversation with the CEO of Coinbase, Brian Armstrong. Shanali. Thank you, Scarlett. And Brian, thank you for joining us. A big question that's out there in the market now is with Binance facing such severe pressures and more than $4 billion fine, what does this all mean for Coinbase now? Hmm. Well, I think this is really um, a vindication of the long-term strategy that Coinbase has taken to build a trusted and regulated company. Going back to 2012, we really decided to do that and got the licenses and got the teams in place that were necessary to run that type of company. And then every few years, we did see a new company come on the scenes that didn't take that approach. Sometimes they would grow very quickly because uh, they were able to offer products that we didn't think were legal. But inevitably, inevitably they do come crashing down. You know, Regulators do eventually act even if they don't act quickly and that's what we saw here in this case today so um, it's not only been a I think an opportunity for coinbase to to step in but it's also an opportunity for the industry I think to turn the page here and say that yeah some of the rules are clear around AML KYC OFAC that the issues that Binance really had um, you know stepped over the line on but some of the areas of the law are not yet clear we need to go get that regulatory clarity to make sure that the future of this industry is built here in america not on offshore unregulated exchanges and so that's what we need to go do next and i think it'll prevent this kind of activity in the future but listen even with this crackdown that you're seeing there were some really scathing allegations in the doj's crackdown uh sanctions violations uh, illegal trafficking of drugs you know how do you know that this is it how do you know that there are not more bad actors out there that would continue to stain crypto? Well, I can tell you uh, the companies that I really engage with, uh, at least especially the ones here built in the United States, they don't get the big headlines because it's not salacious. Um, they haven't you know, rocketed up because you know, they're not following the rules. But there are dozens of really well-intentioned and well-funded uh, and compliant US-based crypto companies that are building this industry. I mean, you have to remember that 52 million Americans have used crypto now, uh, about 400 million people globally. And so um, while there is there are bad actors who try to use crypto, uh, the best data we have is that that's less than 1% of the activity is for illicit purposes. By the way, the US dollar cash is about 4% illicit activity. So crypto is really not uniquely crime-ridden and the centralized actors in crypto they need to follow these rules around transaction monitoring, KYC, AML, just that like Coinbase has been doing for over a decade now to mm -hmm. make sure bad actors don't uh, take advantage of these systems. Listen, Ryan, you mentioned an opportunity to step in a little more. It begs the question, have you been seeing any inflows into Coinbase from Binance.com? Well, I think it's a little too early to say that today. The, the news has just come out in the last hour or so. but. I can tell you that over the last year, Coinbase has certainly been making investments in international expansion and launching our derivatives products uh, to make sure that we were ready for something like this to happen. I mean, it, it, this has been a widely anticipated event. It's been public news for quite some time, but there's been a DOJ investigation. So I don't think it came as a surprise to anybody in the space. And I do think there's an opportunity here for Coinbase to step in. And do you see a chance to buy assets, whether they're part of Binance or, or otherwise? That's not our focus for right now. Um, you know, I think there's, we, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't really be buying them for the technology or anything like that because we have that already on our side. And, you know, I think what we've seen today with this uh, criminal plea is that there's probably concerns over there about just the culture and everything that needs to be reformed. Um, we, we're not really looking at any of these assets from an M&A point of view. We just want to keep building our own products and services um, and, and doing what we've been doing on that front. So I'm looking forward to it actually as an opportunity to kind of turn the page as an industry and, and, and get back to building now that we've had um, a couple of these uh, bad actors um, you know, brought to justice. Listen, it's worth also talking about the suit you're also facing from the SEC. We know you've been fighting this suit, this idea that the SEC has charged you for operating as an unregistered securities exchange broker and clearing agency. What has the tone been like with the SEC since this suit was filed and since you started fighting back? Yeah, well, I think it's important for people to just keep in mind that these are apples and oranges, right? And you know, our uh, our case is a civil case over some technical matters about what is a co what commodity, what is a security, and we're essentially availing ourselves of the court to go get that clarity in the form of case law, since it was not provided by the regulator. And so, kind of regardless of the outcome of that case, we'll finally start to get some clarity for the industry on um, where the line is there. The Binance case uh, here was was a criminal proceeding, uh, very different, and and the dollar amounts are you know pretty eye watering. So um, with that, you know, as a backdrop, 
I, I think that Coinbase really has an opportunity to help foster this, uh, this regulatory clarity going forward. As I mentioned, I think the AML, KYC, OFAC rules have been clear for a long time. All centralized financial services, including in crypto, need to follow those rules. But what's not yet clear is um, the market structure about how we're going to have crypto commodities secure and crypto securities. You know, what is the process for a crypto security to actually go in and register? What sort of entity might it be traded on? These questions are still unfortunately left unanswered. And so we're either going to have to get clarity from the courts, um, maybe from Congress. And there's a couple of bills going through Congress right now that have passed mm -hmm. with bipartisan support in the committees um, or or something else will have to happen. But I do believe that the U.S. Right. will eventually get this right. Brian, we're committed to the U.S. And, and helping ensuring that happens. Brian, why would anybody buy crypto after such severe abuses were seen at other exchanges and the use of funds uh, for illegal activity? What, how, how does the industry, after the fall of FTX and after this massive fine in Binance, how, does he, how do Americans get you know, confidence in crypto again? Well, you have to remember that, you know, the prices in crypto are up 200 percent year to date and about 52 million Americans have used crypto about one, you know, one in five. So um, there's a lot of reasons people are excited about this technology. Of course, we see headlines periodically with bad actors trying to use it. But as I mentioned before, the best data we have is that that's less than one percent of the activity in crypto. So people are, are interested in crypto for all kinds of reasons. They're interested in updating the financial system, which is slow and expensive and it's not everyone has equal access to it. They're interested in it from a technology um, that can update that financial system and provide economic freedom all over the world. Um, mm -hmm. They're interested in it because of Web3 and how creative people and artists can have more direct relationships with their fans. They're interested in it as a way to kind of, um, you know, get out of the system of big tech companies and actually control their own identity mm -hmm. online. So people are looking at it a lot like they looked at the early days of the Internet back in the early 2000s. And, there, you know, there were scams on the Internet. There was bad actors. There was bubbles. But of course, the Internet was just a fundamentally a technology that, you know, democratized access to information. Crypto is democratizing speaking, access to value, mm -hmm. making it more efficient, how it moves all over the world. Right. And that's speaking, very exciting. But for speaking lots of, of the democratization, you know, you guys have started a, a super PAC around the idea of more money going into the elections, uh, supporting the crypto industry. How much of your own personal funds are you willing to put towards the PAC? And are you selling Coinbase shares to fund it? Yeah, well, I do think it's very important for crypto companies and, and the venture community and everybody really, all, really all of the users of crypto, the, the customers of crypto, the 52 million Americans to get involved in this at this point. Because unfortunately, um, you know, while crypto, crypto is a very bipartisan issue in uh, D.C. and we actually see the broad sentiment is very reasonable. It's just saying we need to put out some clear rules. Unfortunately, there are a small group of people who are trying to curtail the industry or push it back. And so... Um, I think that we all need to kind of come together to donate to super PACs um, like the one that I did. And, you know, I'm not necessarily selling Coinbase shares to do that, but um, I personally donated to it. I think a number of other crypto companies are going to do that. And most importantly, we need to see the Amer 52 million Americans do that. Mm -hmm. There's actually a website that has come together, standwithcrypto.org, which is helping organize this effort. And we've uh, got over 100,000 people now in the U.S. Right. who've raised their hand and said, Brian, said, I really want to see clear rules here. Before I let you go here, I want to ask one more question. J.P. Morgan today really uh, spread some doubt about your ability to kind of maintain uh, such rigor in your earnings with the advent of an ETF tied to Bitcoin. How do you respond to that? Oh, well, I think the ETF applications are really great for crypto and for Coinbase. Um, it's great for crypto because it's going to bring in many new large pools of capital that traditionally haven't been able to dr uh, directly participate in crypto. And then it's good for Coinbase because we've been named as the custodian um, on almost all of these ETF applications. And so we'll participate in the value stream there. So we're very positive on the ETFs. Brian, thank you for your time today. Really landmark day for the industry. That is Brian Armstrong, the CEO of Coinbase. Romain, back to you. All right, as we wrap up our coverage here on The Close, it has been quite a day, Scarlett, from everything going on with OpenAI to everything going on with NVIDIA, and then, of course, with Binance yeah. here. 
Let's see, is tomorrow gonna to be just as busy? We're gonna stay on, of course, the open AI saga as Bloomberg is reporting that there is negotiations out there. There are negotiations out there to try to put this thing back together with Sam Altman at the So maybe home. it's like rewinding the clock all the way back to Thursday at the end of all this. I know, David Weston said it's like putting Humpty Dumpty uh, back together again. We actually got some earnings tomorrow as well. Yeah, Deer, which is the world's biggest uh, farm equipment maker is gonna come out. Uh, and of course, we'll be all over that tomorrow morning. Absolutely, and we're actually gonna have a sit down with the CEO of JC Penny. We we haven't talked about them a lot, but of course, in the retail space, uh, there's a lot that can be learned from that and some economic data tomorrow as well. Yeah, there's a lot because Thursday's a holiday, so you got jobless claims on a Wednesday. You also have durable goods and, of course, the final reading of University of Michigan sentiment surveys. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how we're feeling yes, heading into uh, the Inflation Thanksgiving holiday oh, and, this, uh, and the shopping season, Scarlett. Yes. Don't forget. You know, I mean, I like everyone swiping on their couch on Friday. All right. That does it for us here on the close. Scarlett and I will be back tomorrow, but stick around. Balance of power is coming up next right here in the U.S. Have a great evening. This is Bloomberg.